Welcome to Pick 6 Movies, the only podcast on the internet where each season we select six movies all related to a common theme. Then, in each episode, we discuss some history behind how and why the movie got made. Following that, we give you a full review of the movie Soup to Nuts to see if it's any good. This we of which I speak is none other than my lifelong and dearest friend, Mr. Bo Ransdell, and me, Chad Cooper. This season's theme is Stream On, featuring six movies that were made or distributed on streaming services. Your Hulus, your Netflixes, your Amazon Primeses, your HBO Maxes, you know, all those things you forgot to cancel after your free seven-day trial. Tonight's movie is the brainchild of filmmaker Zack Snyder, the Debbie Downer of directors. And like so many filmmakers before him, Snyder took something that was popular with movie-going audiences, as well as those lazy people who just sit at home and watch streaming services. I'm talking about zombie-focused entertainment people. And he decided to reimagine it, or reboot it, or revamp it, or redo it. Maybe re did he restart it? He re reinvigorate? He re really messed it up. Look, he did something when it came to the zombie genre of filmmaking and entertainment. Spoilers, it's not a very good movie. But heck, at least he got his movie made, <laughs> although it's not very good. But filmmakers have a long history of pitching sequels and spinoffs to popular movies and film genres. Some of them get made, like this one, that's not very good, and some of them suffer a fate of what could have been. To learn more about this topic, you can visit your local library, where you will probably see people busy banning lots of books, or you can let Mr. Bo Ransdell's velvety voice fill your ears with tales of what could have been and how what is came to be. Bo, do your thing. In the weeks before its release in June of 1982, Universal Pictures knew they had a winner on their hands. Steven Spielberg's E.T. the Extraterrestrial was going to be a bona fide hit. It had everything audiences clamored for. There was drama and emotion and thrills and spectacle, and at the center of it all was a story of friendship. Spielberg, who had practically invented the summer blockbuster with Jaws, had done it again. And like any good business, Universal sought to replicate that success with a sequel. So they turned to Spielberg himself and asked him to offer up a pitch for E.T. 2. As you may or may not know, Spielberg's first swipe at E.T. was not the cute and cuddly family affair that made it to the big screen. His first pitch was a movie called Night Skies, about a family who ran afoul of some nasty aliens. Over time, and through multiple drafts with screenwriter Melissa Matheson, E.T. was born. But Spielberg held on to the idea of his nasty aliens. He wanted to do something with more teeth, if you will, a response to the feel-good alien encounter of Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and later, E.T. the Extraterrestrial. And so enter E.T. 2, Nocturnal Fears. While E.T. was all touchy-feely, a story about intergalactic friendship and, yes, even love, the sequel was to be a darker, more mature affair. Spielberg penned a short treatment for his proposed sequel, and you can even find it online, but why do that when you can get a snarky synopsis from yours truly? So, our story begins with a mothership landing, just like at the beginning of the original E.T., only this time, the aliens that emerge are evil. See, these aliens hate E.T. species, and have come to the planet looking for the stranded E.T., who we learned is named Zrek in the treatment. These evil aliens are led by the vicious Corel, who sends his crew into the woods to search for Zrek. Also, the evil aliens, which look like albino versions of E.T. or Zrek, if we're being accurate, give off this weird hum that has a hypnotic effect on the creatures of the forest, making it easier, one supposes, for these carnivorous E.T.s to hunt. Corel then orders all the evil ETs back to the ship with his super hypnosis, and we see that the ship inside is filled with these laser cages that are filled up with plants and animals from previous hunts. But what of Elliot and the gang, you ask? Well, they are left tremendously lonely by the absence of their pal E.T., but have become closer as a family. They have E.T.'s speak and spell communicator on the roof of their house to try to get E.T. to come back, but no luck so far. 
Their mom is now officially divorced and is dating the guy with the keys from the original who has had a complete change of heart after his encounter with E.T. or Zrek. I just can't get over how unpleasant a name that is. Anyway, he has devoted himself to science and medicine now, but is worried that the kids are too preoccupied with meeting Zrek again. Elliot has been having some strange feelings of late, and he thinks that maybe Keys is wrong and Zrek is coming back. He gets his older brother Michael and younger sister Gertie to come with him to the clearing where they last saw ugh, Zrek, thinking that he might have returned. Ignoring recent reports of cattle mutilations nearby, the kids descend on the forest where they find another spacecraft. The door opens and out comes Corell, who asks them telepathically where Zrek is. The kids say, oh, he went home, and he zaps the kids with his super hypnosis, and the kids wake up surrounded by these albino carnivorous ETs, and so begins an interrogation scene in which Elliot and his siblings are questioned and tortured by telepathic what's to give up Zrek's location. Also, there are notes about alien examinations. It sounds horrific. One of the lines from the treatment in this section reads, quote, Gertie is crying and calling for Mary, the mom, and E.T. for help. Yikes. So, Mom and Keys realize the kids are gone and it's very late, so they head out to look for them. Back to the interrogation of Elliot, which would have been a big part of this movie. Another quote. The questioning process intensifies when they learn from his memory that he has dealt directly with Zrek. The pain is tremendous for Elliot, and he breaks down and begins screaming for E.T.'s help. Double yikes. So, this scream apparently floats across the universe and reaches Zrek through his psychic connection with Elliot or something. And so, Mary and Keys find the communicator on the roof, which is scratching out the message, E.T. help Elliot soon. So, they follow a hunch and head to the forest too. This all ends when E.T. shows up at the evil spaceship with finger lit and heart glowing, having received Elliot's message. E.T. also apparently has super hypnosis and freezes all the evil aliens, frees the kids, and sets the evil E.T.'s navigation to somewhere in the far reaches of space, and off they go. Mary and Key show up to see the kids reunite with E.T., and then it's back to space as the good guy mothership arrives and takes E.T. away again. The humans watch as E.T. fucks off once more. The last line of the treatment is, I kid you not, dreams can come true. Sure, if it's dreams of scenes of kids being tortured. Spielberg abandoned the project after a time, holding to his personal philosophy of no sequels, unless you count the Indiana Jones movies, I guess. Or maybe someone pointed out how grim this movie was and it left it rightly in the dustbin of history. There have been any number of movies that almost became real, though. There's a whole movie about Alejandro Jodorowsky's Dune, which would have been this crazy sci-fi experimental film and was shit-canned for being too crazy for studios who didn't want to shell out that much money for the guy who had made El Topo. There's Ghostbusters 3 Hellbent, which would have found the Ghostbusters fighting the devil himself. This one was tossed because Bill Murray kept refusing to do another Ghostbusters movie until everyone aged out of the parts and moved on with their lives. At least until those awful reboots and reimaginings came along. Or Spider-Man 4 from Sam Raimi, who was eager to give his take on the classic Spider-Foe The Vulture, but was so disillusioned by the process of Spider-Man 3 that he walked away. Apparently, he never wanted Venom in Spider-Man 3, but the studio insisted, leaving him with a movie cobbled together from his original tale of the Sandman and the alien goo notes from the executives. More recently, Sony was planning on an animated Sly Cooper movie based on the video game featuring a thieving raccoon and his pals who help him on his heists. There is some test footage out there if you want to see it, but this one was canned on account of the Ratchet and Clank movie fizzling at the box office. In the Thank God This Monstrosity Was Stopped news, Robert Zemeckis was going to do a remake of the classic Beatles cartoon Yellow Submarine, only using that hideous motion capture process he used in the Polar Express. Fortunately for all of us, the critical and box office disasters of Mars Needs Moms and A Christmas Carol with Jim Carrey put the kibosh on any of that nonsense. One that's personal to me is the long-awaited and oft-delayed version of H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness, directed by Guillermo del Toro. Universal was going to do it, but only if Del Toro could bring it in as a PG-13 movie. Del Toro said, no way, and Universal dropped it. He still talks about making the movie, and someday we may even get it, but as of this moment, it is a pipe dream. Along with the Stanley Kubrick Napoleon movie we never got, or the version of Heart of Darkness Orson Welles wanted to make after Citizen Kane. Film history is rife with movies that were on deck for production, and for one reason or another, just never found the path to being made. 
Some of these sound hideous and some sound glorious, but such is the nature of film. It's way easier and cheaper to not make a movie than to make one. And so it's always a minor miracle when all the contracts are signed and cameras start rolling. Which brings us to a discussion of this episode's movie, Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead. Much like the zombies of the film, this was a movie that died again and again and somehow shambled its way to production. When Zack Snyder made his spin of George Romero's Dawn of the Dead, horror nerds like me and former intern Garrett lined up knives out for this movie. How on earth could it be any good a remake of one of the most beloved and critically lauded horror movies of the past 50 years? And then the remake arrived, and most of us were left eating a little crow. Zack Snyder and screenwriter James Gunn did exactly what you ought to do when remaking a Stone Cold classic. You don't. You do your own thing. Sure, there was a mall and zombies, but that's pretty much where the similarities ended. These zombies were fast and aggressive, the movie just as music video cool as the time called for. And in the aftermath of the surprise hit, Zack Snyder had an idea for a sequel, a story of a father saving his little girl from zombie-infested Las Vegas. Warner Brothers announced production of Zack Snyder's Army of the Dead three years after the success of Dawn of the Dead, way back in 2007. During the writing of that script with Joby Harold, Snyder realized that this would be a spiritual sequel more than a direct one, that he would need a new origin story to fit the story he wanted to tell. A year later, Matthias van Helningen Jr. was selected to direct the movie, which would have been his feature debut. Three years later, that movie was still in development hell, that place where no one can agree on the script or the budget, and enough languishing here and movies tend to disappear. The director did at least go on to make the movie The Thing, the prequel to John Carpenter's 1982 classic, which is not very good. To assure us all it's better that this version did not get made, Van Heiningen said the movie was set to contain scenes of male zombies raping live human females to create hybrid human zombie offspring. Uh, no thank you. After Warner Brothers shelved the whole thing in 2012, it looked like Army of the Dead was just that, dead. But flash forward seven years. In January 2019, streamer Netflix saw an opportunity for an original film that would both capture the allure of a sequel to a popular film and highlight a much-talked-about director, Zack Snyder. Snyder was in the throes of the release the Snyder Cut business and still dealing with the tragic loss of his daughter. Netflix would give Snyder $90 million to do as he wished. So, Snyder went to work, rewriting his original script with a new co-writer, Shea Hatton, who was also a writer on John Wick 3. Snyder said that when he told Netflix about Army of the Dead, the head of original film Scott Stuber told him, quote, go write it tomorrow and we'll shoot it in a week. Dave Bautista initially balked at starring in the film, but Snyder convinced him on the back of the script and opportunity to be in a big action movie. And Bautista even left James Gunn's The Suicide Squad to take the meteor role in Snyder's movie. By July 19th, the whole cast was in place, including comedian Chris D'Elia as the Snyder helicopter pilot and Matthias Schweighofer as the German safecracker who said he relished the opportunity to play a German with a sense of humor. The cast went off to zombie boot camp where they would be trained to handle the fake weapons like they were real, and then filming began in July of 2019. Snyder would not only direct, but he would shoot the movie as well, his first all-digital production. He used some lenses he bought off of eBay that he liked to give the movie what he called a, quote, dreamlike and out-of-focus look that I think is code for crappy. Anyways, the movie wrapped in July 2019, and then it was off to post-production. During the post-work, actor and comedian Chris D'Elia was credibly accused of sexual misconduct with minors, and Snyder scrubbed him from the movie, literally. He digitally replaced him with comedian Tig Notaro. Because the rest of the cast was off to the winds working on other things, Notaro worked with an acting partner and filmed entirely in front of green screen, and then was digitally inserted into the movie. She joked later that she's never even met Dave Bautista. So in March of 2021, Snyder finally announced that the movie was finished. And then a full press marketing blitz ensued with wrestling tie-ins thanks to Bautista, who apparently was a wrestler of some note, and lots of showcases of the movie's first 15 minutes. To coincide with the movie's Netflix release, the streamer also released Army of the Dead into theaters in May of 2021, 
you know, for Oscar consideration. And it was a pretty big hit for Netflix. They counted 75 million households viewing the movie in the first week. This was also about the time 75 million people started wondering why there were dead pixels on their TV. Turns out that it was just a bum digital camera, but it made everyone wonder why it was left in the final product. The critics were mixed, which is shocking. Lots called it fun and stylized and gory, and many credited the mix of actors as contributing to the movie's good time. I assume this is because they watched it in the throes of the pandemic, and we all just wanted everything to be okay again. And it spawned a sequel, Army of Thieves, directed by and starring the humorous German Matthias Schweighofer. There's some animated business serving as a prequel as well, and Snyder has threatened us with a sequel set in New Mexico called Planet of the Dead. We can only hope that goes the way of Zemeckis' yellow submarine. But for now, we must deal with the dreck that staggered its way to our screens. And to feast on this tainted flesh, I need the mouth of Chad to join in. Ladies and gentlemen, zombie kings and zombie queens, it's 2021's Army of the Dead. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to yet another episode of Pick 6 Movies. This time we are going to be addressing an old favorite here on the show, (laughs) which is Zack Snyder, who, much like Heath Ledger, I can't quit. I can. I can quit him. (laughs) Yeah. I can say unilaterally, hi, everybody. It's me, Chad. I may never watch another Zack Snyder movie again after this. I'm washing my hands of him. There's nothing in his catalog that may ever show up on this podcast again. I don't think that's the wrong way to go with this. This is... One of the reasons that I didn't want to do those Justice League movies, like I saw this when it came out, Uh huh. and thinking, as I mentioned in the introduction, Garrett the intern and I both were texting one another, this is before you ever interned here, I just knew him from the convention circuit. He sent me to my house, and I've moved since he was with us, he got my address, but he sent me a box full of pictures that he printed out of what he did over Thanksgiving and Christmas, mm-hmm. and none of it involves what you do at thanksgiving and christmas there was no note it was just a box of pictures of him just ghost tours and there was a thing where he was knitting little figurines of horror movie icons Mm -hmm. out of yarn who do you think he was knitting for man i got a box i don't look along with a a large selection of polaroids of the people he lives around (laughs) it's so weird yeah he's an interesting one (laughs) we need to hire him let's get him a job (laughs) i mean if you mean get him a job like let's call some people we know that might be hiring i don't know that we need him full time on the pick six tip but he's on the mount rushmore of pick six movies interns he's absolutely there for sure for sure he is look i mean there's a reason we changed the locks (laughs) and changed the coats on the doors but yeah i mean this was a movie that when it came out i really loved Zack snyder's dawn of the dead and i've seen it a couple of times in the the years between its release and now and i still enjoy it i think it's a good movie but it's also written by james gunn very clearly written by james gunn yes and watching this it's like boy what a difference a writer makes huh Uh -huh. said the suicide squad (laughs) right right when james gunn took over the dc movie you know i I hesitate to universe or multiverse or whatever yeah but i was like oh yeah great he knows how Mm -hmm. to make these kinds of movies so that's i heard that same thing when it was like jk abrams is taking over star wars and star trek and the willy wonka series and warner brothers cartoons and everything and you're like the difference is i've always thought that jj abrams sucked i think other than cloverfield which is an okay movie i don't think he's made a good movie he has a good TED talk about the mystery box. I like that. Yeah, but so it's what? not a movie. Yeah, that's not a movie. That's a speech. <laughs> Martin Luther King also <laughs> made several good speeches. I wouldn't trust him to make a movie, mm. mostly because he's dead. <laughs> right. <laughs> 
Let's talk about Zack Snyder who can't make a movie. I feel like his movies are way too long. Uh-huh. They, and also, more importantly, they're just bummers. They're no fun. They're filled with paper thin characters. The storytelling is not very good. And it is the opposite of the reason I watch every movie. Chad, I'm so happy to hear you say this. I feel like finally, <laughs> after years of me saying this to you, <laughs> finally you've come around to the fact that Zack Snyder is in the Michael Bay Hall of Fame of just god awful directors that should not be allowed to make movies. I never defended Zack Snyder as a filmmaker. We did that first Justice League years ago. Uh-huh. And then we did the extended cut for our 100th episode just because that was a thing that we did. But they were not good. I never felt that at all. You have to sit through two and a half hours to get through a slog of bullshit. You know what? That should just be called like, oh, yeah, that, you know what this movie is? It's a Snyder. And you're like, oh, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that should just be shorthand for us from now on. Anytime you see a Snyder, it's a movie that's way too long, takes itself too seriously, filled with characters that you don't like, and is a colossal waste of time. And if there's ever a moment of optimism, someone comes in and immediately pisses on it. Yeah. Like, why isn't this movie more fun? It should be more fun. I got a lot of ways that we're going to make this movie a lot less worse. Because right. on paper, hell, in an elevator pitch, you're like, hey, here's what it is. It's Ocean's Eleven during a zombie apocalypse. How much do you need? Can you get it out by spring? Yes. Yeah. And whatever you got. Like, yeah, it's not that hard. And they just fucked up so badly. <laughs> Yeah, it's a real bad idea. Uh, you want to dive into this? You want to get started? Because this is like two and a half hours of movie. We're not going to Snyder this, all right? We're going to make it fun, and we're going to get through this shit in a hurry, all right? So our movie starts off, and we see this caravan of military trucks out in the desert, and they're moving along in a convoy. There's something top secret going on, Bo. And mm-hmm. then we cut to this couple who just got married in Las Vegas, and they're filming themselves on their phones, and they go past the famous Las Vegas City Limit sign. They drive off uh, to do like a little photo op, and... And we see that this guy has a license pl- <laughs> We see that the guy has a vanity plate that says Lucky Bird, L-C-K-Y-B-R-D. And a question I want to pose to you both, have you ever had a personalized license plate? No, of course not. I'm not an asshole. <laughs> That's how I feel. I think anybody who has a personalized license plate, unless it is part of your personal brand as a professional. And let me give you an example. So if you are a veterinarian in a small town and your license plate reads pet vet or if you're a pediatrician and it says kid doc you get a pass on this everybody else middle finger for you let me give you one other scenario where i will personally allow it all right if you have had cancer and beaten it (laughs) and you want to get yourself an f cancer license plate i'm fine with that if you have overcome a terminal illness and want to acknowledge you beating death yes on the back of your car a hundred percent go for it what if you were involved in a gang war and you got shot a lot and didn't die could you have f bullets sure sure if you've turned a corner <laughs> yeah if steve Irwin had lived it would have been f stingrays and some val absent concoction of letters steve Irwin, i probably had a custom license plate already <laughs> If we're being honest with one another. Hey, Steve Irwin gets a a big pass because he died doing what he loved, which is fondling stingrays. But I'm not a Steve Irwin fan. I thought the whole thing of like, crikey, that's a big alligator. It's like, yeah, of course it is. What if his license plate read crikey? It would be like if Gordon Ramsay's license plate was like Hell's Kitchen. But it was spelled all (laughs) fucked up, so it's like KTCN or something like that. You really got to squint and think about it. Like, what's going on? That's Gordon Ramsay. Right. Oh, I get it. Yeah. All right. So we got this couple with the personalized license plate. So we immediately don't like them. As they're cruising along, the bride, she hangs out the window and she screams, I'm a bride, bitches. And you're like, all right, we really don't like you. So we head back to our secret army caravan and we have soldier number one. He's talking to soldier number two and they're really chatting it up. And soldier number one says, hey, what are we hauling that requires so much firepower to protect it? And soldier number two says, well, it could be anything, maybe a nuclear weapon or oh, the original copy of the Constitution. You know? the one that's written in blood by uh, the founding fathers look this is a guy whose job application under hobbies he writes chat rooms i like that one of the pitches that it could be amelia earhart the live one it's like, <laughs> <"Whoa>, what <laughs> 
even if you found Amelia Earhart at this point, she would certainly be dead just due to natural causes. He does throw out, I think it also might be uh, maybe the headpiece of the Staff of Ra from that documentary film, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Just nonsense. It's a bunch of alien stuff and blah, blah, blah. And speaking of aliens, one of these two idiots is like, well, don't you think it's a little weird that we just came from, you know, <clears throat> 51? I was like, why are we talking about aliens in this movie? This is a zombie movie. Why even pepper that in as a potential genesis point for the chaos that's about to ensue? Are we dealing with aliens? Or are we dealing with zombies? I think the alien thing is just a misdirect. Like, I don't think that's really what's going on. Because yeah, but he way says too they much... came from Area 51. Yeah, so what the hell but... do you think you got in the back? It's a fucking alien, Bo. Well, that's what you would think, but I don't think that's right. the case. All right. We come back to our married couple that we don't care for. And the bride, she's wearing this like sexy maid bride costume that you would get at Party City for Halloween. And she says, oh, you're in trouble, mister. I got a present for you for making me an honest woman. And then she pops out her teeth and she starts giving this guy a blowjob. And the husband, he says one of the grossest things I've ever heard, seeing a guy get a blowjob in a movie. He goes, yeah, get in there. And I'm like, barf. Young men who may find themselves in this situation, that's not a phrase you want to use. When someone's giving you a blowjob while you're driving, you don't want to go, yeah, get in there, gross bastard. Well, and and by get in there, I mean, are you talking about the balls? Is that what you're... <laughs> like, I, hey, be sure you get all of it in there. Not just the twig or the berries, too. <laughs> <laughs> she's blowing her new groom he just like rolls his head back and closes his eyes and i'm like look man i'm thinking if you're getting a blow job while driving the needle goes the other way on the attention meter it's not like a time to relax this is where you really focus man exactly here's the push pull of this right i am no expert <laughs> or the but... in out of this the problem is that you've got to focus on the road, but if you're focusing on the road, you're not going to pop. And if you want to pop, you can't focus on the road. Right. So It seems like the best of all worlds. Well, for him, <laughs> not for her, because she's down there like, I'm getting all in it, like you said. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. You going to finish up anytime soon? My jaw's really starting to hurt. As all of this is going on, our convoy is headed in the opposite direction toward them. And as these two things meet toward one another, our groom veers into oncoming traffic and causes an accident, flipping one of the military trucks carrying this special cargo. Now, once it crashes, soldier number one, he's not really harmed. He gets on his radio and he calls back to headquarters, which has the call sign Mothership, again, mm -hmm. alien. And the caravan is called the Four Horsemen, which mm -hmm. I'm like, that re sounds real ominous. But soldier number one says, um, hey there, Mothership, uh, <laughs> oof, you know how you told us to be careful? Well, uh, we kind of, uh, what's the word for it? Fucked up? Because <laughs> uh, we crashed, and there was a big explosion, and there's a car. Looks like a newlywed couple in it burning nearby. I can see the groom. I can see him. Don't worry. Uh, he doesn't have a penis. Uh, I know this because it's sticking out of the bride's mouth, and she's uh, she's over there far from the car. <laughs> At least some of her is. Uh, <laughs> I believe that part of her is remained in the car. And also, there were uh, a number of issues involving her torso uh, getting some road rash far, far away from here. The good news, let me give you some good Remember that big top secret metal container you told us to really take care of? It's intact. It hasn't. Kakunk. Oh, shit. The door opened up. Is that supposed to happen? And the person on the other end of the radio for Mothership is like, <laughs> Four horsemen, get your men and get the fuck out of there right goddamn now. Yeah. Right, you got to go. This is a serious, serious problem. Do you copy that? Four horsemen. Uh, you said wait for the door to open? <laughs> no, get the fuck out. They're gonna die. Get the fuck out of there. So I should only approach if the door is open. You, you're fucked. Do whatever you want. You're gonna all die. Sure <laughs> enough, like while the military guy number one is on, on the horn with headquarters, the other dudes are just approaching this door after it falls open, which begs the question, Chad, if you are hauling something unknown... From a secret military base, mm -hmm. and the door just fell open. Right. Would you take a peek inside, or would you be like, you know what, this feels like it's above my pay grade. I'll be in the car if anyone needs me. Joanne, who works reception, she said it was a big metallic pinata. It's full of candy, from what I understand. Let's go see if we can get something. Oh, Maybe I those fun size Snickers. Snickers? <laughs> <laughs> this hand comes out it's not skeletal exactly but kind of a corpsified hand reaches out and then one of the super fast zombies from 
Zack Snyder's Dawn of the Dead comes out and just starts murdering everyone. Is that what it is? Because I've not seen that that I remember. Yeah. It is a soldier. I We do know that because mm-hmm. it's wearing dog tags and it has a super short crew cut. Yeah. Which we'll get to the crew cut in a bit, but... Or lack thereof. Right. Tie this shit together, you dumb motherfucker. I'm so pissed off at this movie. So, the guys who were in the truck debating, like, what could this be? They see all these people getting murdered, and they're like, oh, we gotta get the fuck out of here. And so they haul Let's go hide on the other side of that hill. He'll never find us there. And then... Snyder just rips off American Werewolf in London, where it's two guys running away from a threat. They think they've gotten away, get startled by something. One of them falls down. And when one of them is helping the other up, the zombie gets him, which is exactly what happens to Griffin Dunn and American Werewolf in London. It is the exact same scene, and it pissed me off because... I was like, American Werewolf in London was done 50 years ago almost. It is way mm-hmm. better than this. Yeah. In my comparisons, there's a whole lot of Jurassic Park in this, but we'll get to that in a moment later. Yeah. Soldier number one and soldier number two, they get got. Mm-hmm. One gets his jaw ripped off, which is pretty good. Yeah. There's a lot of really heavy duty violence in this. Good R rated violence, which uh-huh. I was okay with. Sure. It looks kind of fakey because they're not using practical effects. They're using CGI. And just looking at that my brain knows this is synthetic Mm -hmm. and i'm not saying horror movies from the 60s through the early 2000s until computers took over everything were better it just felt more visceral and here it feels fake the blood feels fake the deaths feel fake Mm -hmm. this is one of the worst looking movies i've ever seen it's pretty bad so our main military zombie he chomps on these other two and he turns them into zombies because that's how it works just like child molesters according to mystic river and then the three of them get up and they trot 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 over come up to this dune overlooking las vegas and you see that it's vegas on the other side and you're like oh okay this is fine this is this should have been a better setup but i'll roll with it and then the movie cuts to liberace or a liberace impersonator which i'm like i have no idea when this movie is taking place and this guy starts playing the piano and it leads into this cheesy cover of viva las vegas which is actually sung by a guy named richard cheese Mm -hmm. who has this comedy act where he covers las vegas classics like nick the lounge singer it's all wacky and over the top and the visuals of this cover are juxtaposed against slow down footage of topless showgirl zombies attacking a man who looks like carl from aqua teen hunger force (laughs) and he's a real creep like you get to see his tight man panties and his dick tucked into him and the zombie showgirls with their boobs out they snatch off his toupee and it's all very ridiculous like they eat him in an oversized hot tub and you're like oh this is going to be that kind of movie it's going to be silly and ridiculous it's going to go to 11 but none of that pays off later it's worth mentioning so we don't get messages from garrett and so that other listeners listening right now don't drive their car off an embankment that this richard cheese song is a callback to dawn of the dead where richard cheese does a cover of down with the sickness in that movie oh i didn't know that because i didn't watch that movie closely yeah you should watch the original dawn of the or not original but the zack snyder dawn of the dead it is maybe the best movie he's ever done which is also because he had no hand in writing any of it right pay close attention i will never ever do that because of this movie (laughs) fair enough fair enough i felt so bad for these actresses playing these topless zombies it serves no purpose other than to set the stage for the ridiculous juxtaposition of a zombie movie in vegas with this casino heist movie that never happens i mean we'll talk about the lack of fun that this movie has but you're right i think the best sequence in the movie is this opening sequence with or the credit sequence where you're seeing zombies going crazy you're seeing planes bombing the las vegas strip but are zombies meant to be something that you fear or something that is humorous or both and i really let me just say to answer my own question i felt like this movie should have leaned way more toward the humorous and less towards the i'm sorry your child has leukemia (laughs) where you're like what the fuck like why are we talking about that there's a a a great example of this is obviously Shaun of the dead where they are both a real threat, but also you find the ridiculousness in the situation. Yes. This movie doesn't do that, though, Bo, at yeah. all. 
Right. It, a couple of times it tries, but it just fails miserably. And you also get these weird inserts because among the other shots that you're seeing in this opening sequence, you're also seeing like Dave Bautista and his family shooting zombies along with some of the other heroes of the movie. But you don't know that at the time, Bo. It's just a bunch of random people killing people. And until you see Dave Bautista, it's like, oh, should I be paying attention to these people? And the weirdest part, and I still don't understand it, now having seen the movie three times. Oh, I'm so sorry. These shots of them holding pictures of themselves in better times, one presumes, as they're standing in the midst of the chaos of Las Vegas and a zombie apocalypse. And like, Apparently at a Shell JCPenney family portrait studio. Like, I don't understand what that is supposed to be telling me about these characters other than maybe like they had a different life before this but uh, okay fine i dislike this movie so much here's what it is it's like hey we're having a good time you know what we should do let's just show people mourning their loved ones in the middle of all this chaos yeah what if we had zombie carrot top and zombie wayne newton killing people as long as we can show people in their despair and how miserable life is and how awful it is to lose a loved one uh, okay I mean, part of me understands this because this is the movie that Zack Snyder made after the death of his child. And I'm sure that a lot of this movie comes from that, or at least the nihilism of the movie comes from that. But it's still a bummer to watch, man. It is, it's still no fun. I understand that you were going through a lot, but that's what therapy's for. Don't subject an audience to your pain. I feel like that if the premise of this movie had been handled by a different writer and a different filmmaker, it's Ocean's Eleven during the zombie apocalypse. Okay, I'm with you. And we're going to cast Nicolas Cage in the lead. He's your Danny Ocean. I'm on board. It's going to be fun and wacky and goofy. And you raise the stakes. Like you mentioned in your intro that one draft of this had him going in to save his daughter. There are no stakes for them going in to do this other than to get money to do nothing. The whole thing is just void of any purpose or meaning and maybe the nihilism of all of this is is at its core. I deal with that shit on a daily basis. That's not why I watch a movie. Particularly a movie about a heist in a casino in Las Vegas at the height of a zombie apocalypse. Like, that sounds like a fun premise. Don't make it a bummer. You can make a sad movie, like make Melancholia and let that be a nihilistic movie or American Psycho or any number of other films. But this premise does not support the level of bummerdom that you're no. asking it to reach like i understand making terrible depressing movies like i've seen shadowlands any number of times and i cry sure. every single time right but this is not that press <laughs> During this opening, the wacky up-tempo cover, it transitions out of this Nick the Lounge singer song, Richard Cheese. He's like, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Allison Crow," And she takes over the lyrics of Leaving Las Vegas. And if you don't know Allison Crow or this cover, hmm, imagine if Lana Del Rey had a daughter with Tom Waits and they raised this child on Lou Reed's Dirty Boulevard. And they asked Ike Turner to be the godfather. That's what you get. It is the most depressing, downtrodden. You go from wacky fun to everything in the, your life has no meaning. It's the most depressing shit in the world. This is where I would have turned off the movie boat. I wrote this in my notes. Here's where I would have walked away. I'm done. If it wasn't for this podcast and having a good time cracking on it for the next 90 minutes or so. Let's get back to you. The nihilism. We meet Van, who is the dude with this saw. But you don't know that. Right. You're just seeing randos shooting people and sawing zombies. You don't know their names. You don't know if they matter. Because you see other people, Bo, who are not in the movie later on. And they're not stars. They're not named actors or actresses. They're just randos. He apparently has a master's in philosophy, I think is what he's holding when we get the JCPenney's glamour shot. I think he also has a sweet spot for German safe crackers. <laughs> Anyway, we see a bunch of these characters that are, are later going to turn out to be some of the members of our heist crew. and then But you the, don't know it. Right. And sort of the last thing you see, speaking of Neil is a bad, we see that the fact that there's stacking storage containers around las vegas to contain this zombie outbreak mm -hmm. and they're putting the last one in place oh my god and running out of the terror Mom! behind her hot on the heels of this lady and her child in her arms daughter yeah 
running in with you. zombies on, uh, on their heels, and the container drops on top of them. Yeah, they're hugging each other, and they get squashed mm-hmm. by the last Tetris brick of this wall of shipping containers around Las Vegas. Yup. Why would you keep watching this? <laughs> I don't know. And yet I did. I watched the whole thing the first time through. I don't know why I did it. I think it's just I was maybe drunk. Maybe I was. That sounds like something I would do. Yeah. <laughs> Have a couple of glasses of wine and watch this terrible movie. Yeah, I had a couple of bottles and I barely made it through. Here's the, the thing, man. Narratives have to do two things. They need to be coherent, meaning that they're told in a logical way. Secondly, they need to be believable to the audience. Okay? Mm-hmm. This movie fails on both fronts. All right? Mm-hmm. Because right here, when they put this wall around Las Vegas made out of shipping containers, my brain was immediately filled with 101 questions. So zombies can't can't climb over a 30 foot wall. Why not? Why are these zombies being contained with shipping containers in the tourist district of Las Vegas? Because earlier you showed them in the suburbs. Was that a problem? Maybe not. I don't know. Did some of them get out? Please answer these questions. Is it localized to just Vegas or is this a worldwide problem? I need to know the answer to just these few questions. And they're just like, like da, 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 don't ask. Don't worry about it because none, none of this means anything. Yeah. And time doesn't matter because apparently, according to Wikipedia, my source of all things that are truthful, we then flash forward five or six years mm-hmm. but they don't say that in the movie it could have been three days who knows and we find ourselves at the lucky boy diner now outside this place Bo, there's a sign that says that the lucky boy diner sells chinese food and hamburger that's on one side and then there's another sign that says they sell hamburgers and malts which first off I am wary of any restaurant that prides itself on two distinctly unrelated types of cuisine. Now, if somebody comes to me and says, hey, I know this amazing Italian place that has the best sushi, I am not going there. There's a place nearby here that you may not be shocked to learn is like, hey, seafood and Chinese food. I'm nope. like, I don't like that. Oh, those are two things that don't sit alongside one another very no. well. No, no, I'm, I'm never going to go there. Also, malts are disgusting milkshakes are awesome but you put some malt in that you ruined it anything with malt in it is no anything with malt in it is vile whoppers taste like you're eating a mummified milk dud oh that's crazy malt out of my everything i hate milk duds and i love whoppers i'm I'm clearly living on the also i don't like the movie et side of the world where it's like we don't like et over here we love malted milk chocolate if i want that taste in my mouth i'll chew on some drywall oh man now that you've said it i like i drink i could go for some drywall chad (laughs) like chocolate malted oval team i have that on the regular malt barf that's why we're so good together all right so we're in this lucky boy diner (laughs) and here we get to meet dave bautista for real and dave bautista he looks like if a thumb were to just come to life he's working the grill and there is this real important exposition coming from a television news station it's like fake cnn but the audio of this newscaster is so low that it is damn near impossible to hear and you wouldn't know it if you didn't have subtitles on luckily i did and the newscaster says in response to the a historic congressional vote that narrowly rattled the controversial proposal to wipe out the last remains of the so-called zombie wars, which drew a dramatic end with the U.S. military suffering massive casualties and being forced to retreat as Las Vegas was walled off with the zombies left inside to haunt the abandoned city. This will mark the culmination of the president's efforts to fulfill his campaign promises to exterminate Las Vegas's undead population by taking an extreme action of dropping a low-yield tactical nuclear bomb on the city of las vegas in four days time coinciding with the sunset on the fourth of july holiday prompting a full evacuation of the mccarran quarantine zone and i was like that was a lot (laughs) could you turn it up so someone else could hear it that is the entire premise of the movie laid out before us but the way it's presented in the movie is like and then the fourth of july zombies and yeah, bomb. And then into this diner work, walk the two most suspicious people to ever walk into a diner, which is a guy named Tanaka, who is this Japanese businessman, Yakuza looking dude. Bly Tanaka. And his bodyguard slash first mate or right hand man. It's his number two. Yeah. His name is Martin. And also Martin wears these big wrap around Elvis impersonator glasses. It's kind of his thing, Bo. Mm-hmm. It's the way Joe Biden wears those aviator glasses. It's like his look. In about 30 seconds, much the way that the exposition of that reporter thing goes, they just tell Dave Bautista, listen, brother, 
there is $200 million under one of these casinos. And my man here, Tanaka, he wants you to get together a team and go into the zombie zone, pick up this money. And it's going to be a cakewalk, man, because the government's gotten rid of most of their people guarding this thing. And so you and your people, you split this money up however you want. We're going to give you $50 million to get that 200 million. So 50 million for you, 150 million for us, all good. And in fact, I'm even going to give you a map so you know that we're operating in good faith here, brother. So mm-hmm. what do you say? How about you go steal a bunch of money from Zombieland? As an observer of this film, I had a lot of questions. Mm-hmm. Number one, how are these people going to move $200 million in cash? Because according to the internet, which is never wrong, <laughs> yeah, $1 million in $100 bills weighs 22 pounds. So okay. $200 million weighs 4,400 pounds. That is the weight of a car, Bo. Uh-huh. You're not going to do this. Here's how we make your movie less worse. Ready? Okay. Don't make the goal to steal that much cash. It's a MacGuffin. It doesn't matter what they're stealing. Make it a computer chip, a diamond worth $200 million, a painting. It doesn't fucking matter. Just have them going to steal something. We need you to steal a herd of elephants. A uh, mm, herd of elephants. Huh? That's going to be tough. We need you to get us the most valuable lead bars that were ever made. Now there's 4,000 of them. So the whole thing is going to, is going to take about, (laughs) I don't know, 12,000 tons. What we need you to do is to steal the Bly hotel, the whole hotel, because all of the (laughs) copper wiring in it, according to the movie Samaritan are worth $220 million. Now we're going to give you $50 million worth of copper wire. That's a fact. Man, we got this boy uh, named Jace uh, who is going to roll up in with the shopping cart. <laughs> He'll pour it over for you cart by cart and you can cash it in. You, uh, but you don't need to do this. It's, again, one of those little details that you're like, wait, what? Is it most of this digital? All right. All uh. right. The way to do it is like, hey, on tour at the time was the Hope Diamond or whatever. And now that we've got this fancy diamond just sitting in a vault, let's go get it and we can all make $300 million or whatever. Right. In thinking about this movie, if it were a heist film in Vegas with a zombie apocalypse starring Nicolas Cage, you're like, oh, that would work because he won a Best Actor Oscar for Leaving Las Vegas. He was in a honeymoon in Vegas. I think Elvis is contractually in about half the movies he ever makes either in song or spirit start the movie with this diner scene have tanaka come in propose what he wants him to do i want you to pull off a heist here's what's going to happen and then you have nick cage go i'm in but what do i need to do about the zombies you know right then you and then your you're your like oh, oh shit here we go what are we gonna do about you don't need to show zombies. a mother and a daughter holding each other and getting crushed by giant shipping containers so we go back to the hovel that Medal of Honor winner Dave Bautista is living in for no apparent reason. I thought it might have been in the back of the diner or something or you know, some strip right. mall that was converted to apartments. It's Steve Martin's apartment from The Jerk <laughs> sure. in the gas station or something. I mean, I don't understand why a Medal of Honor winner who fought in the zombie wars and all that, like it's still clearly a point of interest. Why is he not on the talk show circuit? Why is he not coming? collecting some sort of retirement benefits yeah why is he flipping burgers and he clearly hates it here's another piece of shit about this movie he's watching (laughs) tv and it's some fake news debate show and here we see sean spicer former trump white house press secretary and contestant on dancing with the stars debating with former dnc chairwoman donna Mm brazil about the eradication of zombies by the government one i don't like seeing this injection of real people or news anchors or pundits in movies in an attempt to ground the film in the real world it's distracting movie makers stop doing this shit number two the only time that this ever worked with kind of a wink and a nod to the camera was in the movie day where they brought in real politicians to talk about like silly political issues but it wasn't there to ground it in reality it was there to sort of just let's have fun with the premise that we're talking about but i hate this shit and in dave it's different too because you're talking about a movie about politics Right. That's the core of it. Right. That's what I'm saying. Like, you're just having fun with the premise. In this case, like, why is Sean Spicer here? Man, I did not like this movie. So he unrolls this map and is sort of eyeballing like, I guess this could work. 
This is a big map. That's a lot of money. And cut to his daughter, we will learn. But, you know, spoilers, yeah. it's his daughter. Sure. Her name is Cade. And she's yeah. at one of the facilities, this Macquarie facility, right next to the quarantine zone. And she and her friend Gita are talking about how Gita is going to take her three kids. Is that the mom? Yes. Dude, I struggled to find her name and I didn't know what it was. Yeah. But anyway, that's fine. So they're talking about how Gita is going to take her three kids. All the quarantine zone is being moved, as we heard in the very low exposition. Mm -hmm. So Gita is worried that they're not going to be able to make a life for themselves because they don't have any money. They've been trapped in this quarantine zone for a while. And Kate is like, no, 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 it's going to be cool. And Gita is like, well, if something happens to me, Kate, will you take care of my kids? And she's like, uh. Oh my God, what? I'm 23. I'm not raising your children. You raise your kids. Then Gita is like, hey, Kate, I know that you know Coyote Lily, who can get yeah? people into the quarantine quarantine zone in I Las swear Vegas. to God if you go into that fucking quarantine zone and don't come back and you ask me to raise these kids I'm not doing that shit I'm not raising your kids do not go in there look I can really make something of my life if I yes go in and get yes, some money you can. no don't do that but I think it would really help and so no. would you just introduce me to Coyote Lily no I won't because if you go in there and you try to crack open a slot machine or some shit to get a couple of grand and you get killed, I'm not raising these kids. Your kid doesn't even know how to fucking wipe himself. He smells like shit all the time. The other one's got that weird cross eye. I don't know which one to look at. I can't deal with that forever. I'm 23. Look at me. My body's still tight. I got a chance to make something myself. Not like you. I mean, you're great, but still. And then, Chad... <laughs> we introduce one of the least appealing characters in almost any film, which is Pornstash, mm -hmm. who is a guard <laughs> at this quarantine facility mm. who walks up and is just like ladies 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 what are you guys talking about by the way why don't you shut the fuck up all right i'm gonna take your temperature with this gun see if you're infected or maybe maybe i'll use my rectal thermometer <laughs> Dude. i'm talking that's a reference to my penis going in one of your holes <laughs> and then he kind of borderlines threatens them by taking their temperatures and kate is like oh my god you suck and he's like you know aggression is one of the first signs of being a zombie i could kill you right now and even gita is like he could, totally could like he is the authority around here so eventually he takes off he's like you're both okay you're both in, within the margin of error or whatever why don't you ask him to take care of your kids he would be a good dad I'm a terrible mom. Do not ask me to watch your children. I swear to God, I've never seen your son without one of his fingers in his nose. He's disgusting. All right? I do not want to be the mother of your kids. I swear to God, if you go into the zombie zone and you don't come back, I'm leaving your children. I tell you what, I'm going <laughs> to hang him over the edge of the wall, all these containers and stuff, and use them like minnows. I'm going to catch me some zombies. <laughs> I don't care. I'm going to use them as bait, Gita. I hate them. We then cut to Dave Bautista, who a lot of times in this movie looks like he's in mid-sneeze or like a sneeze wind-up because he's about to start crying uncontrollably. And yeah. uh, he's got a gun in his hand. And he's pointing at this woman and she's banging on a door and scratching at it with her fingernails. And then Dave Bautista, he drops his gun and everything goes into slow motion. And we get this blurred visual state. So you're like, oh, we're in some kind of a flashback or something or maybe dave bautista got roofied but i'm like mm -hmm. we'll go a flashback for now and then dave bautista who just a few seconds ago had a gun in his hand he pulls out a big knife and with one arm he holds this crazy woman who you realize is a zombie and he just stabs her in the top of the head and mm -hmm. kills her and then the door that she was banging on opens up and inside we see it's kate and here it's you learn that this is dave bautista's daughter maybe they don't really ever explicitly explain that and then kate screams oh my god mom i can't believe day bautista killed my mom <laughs> yeah. and then day bautista wakes up with a oh, 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 oh. it was all dream and then calls tanaka and says i had to give you the satisfaction but I'll take the job. And Tanaka is like, well, you're going to need a safe cracker and a helicopter pilot at least. Yeah. I'll send you an address. Be there at 4 p.m. tomorrow. Tomorrow? They already gave us a ticking clock. We got four days to wrap this shit up. I'm like, okay, so now we're down to three? He spent a day just sleeping on it, <laughs> yeah. right? 
Well, and then Tanaka <laughs> hangs up with this dude and turns around to some military types that are hanging out at his house. And this is it kind of gives you a little bit of a glimpse of here's what the real end game is. But he tells these military types like Dave Bautista's in and they all seem very happy about that. <laughs> so the first person Dave Bautista goes to is his old pal Cray is her name in the film i thought it was maria is it cray i think it's maria cray i don't know oh okay. it doesn't matter let's call her maria no, no. she's all kind-hearted and she's working on cars she's a mechanic and these two people come in and they were like no quiero dinero no she's like you're okay well i'll fix your car and then dave bautista just walks up he's like we were in the military together you want to go steal some money with me and she says sure and then yeah. We cut to another scene where Dave Bautista and Maria go to meet a guy named Vanderho, who's helping this old woman with her physical therapy in a swimming pool. So you're like, oh, I guess he's a good guy. Dave Bautista and Maria, they show up and Dave Bautista goes, hey, Vanderho. We were in the military together. You want to go steal some money with me and Maria? And Vader says, sure. So then they, they get him. And then they go meet with computer-generated Tignataro. <laughs> Dude. <laughs> Obviously, I mentioned this in the introduction, but... Once you know that she never interacts with anyone real in this movie, it is right. so entirely obvious that that's what it, like the tone of her responses is off. It's like Haley Joel Osment talking to Bruce Willis in the sixth sense. <laughs> it's like, yeah. okay, she's there, but she's not there the whole movie. I see Tig people. <laughs> and one of the funnier written characters i mean it's not a great character because they're all kind of paper thin and awful but her performance as this character isn't terrible it just doesn't jive with the rest of the scene i think if chris delia had been in this it wouldn't have been much better it's so out of place in the broader context of the film's tone they ask her like hey we're gonna go up to las vegas and steal some money and we'll give you two million dollars and she goes I'm in a hundred percent. My life sucks and I'm more than happy to change it with $2 million. So yeah, let's do this. All of the jokes that she cracks in this movie are so out of place. It would be like if you took a fart machine to an AA meeting. <laughs> <laughs> like people are just like burying their soul and dealing with their horrible demons and then you get a nice leslie nielsen <laughs> that was funny right like no so then they go get a guy named guzman who is best known for going into las vegas with his buddies to film himself shooting zombies for youtube doesn't this just all feel like oh let's do something about social media and he's a youtuber and his character doesn't amount to shit in this movie oh no 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 it's crazy because he he brings a friend that has more agency in this film than he does yeah his lady friend right she's more important than him there's a weird thing where when they're picking him out dave bautista is like are we sure we want this guy what's his deal anyway and maria says there are reddit forums devoted it to him as if that's a recommendation for a heist right. uh-huh but anyway he's in because they offer him like fifteen thousand dollars or something ridiculously cheap this is the equivalent of like roll it up to the home depot and pay it 10 get bucks in. an hour for, right, yeah. for someone to do your roof and then they get a safe cracker Dieter, who they find at just like a safe and lock store in a strip mall between a payday cash loan and a nail salon oh i thought it was a safe cracker store where Jesus you just Christ. go in like i need a safe cracker <laughs> oh i'm a safe cracker they show him the schematics of the safe that they need to have open and dave bautista says can you open the safe and dieter says i can say with all humility that the greatest likelihood of the cracking of the safe is most probable when it includes the world's greatest safe cracker and that is me tita i have some coupons for the nail salon next door hmm? Do you need an unlicensed acupuncturist? I have a good recommendation. Three doors down. And Dave Bautista is, is, is kind of fondling the schematics of this safe. And he goes, get your hands off that, Mr. Big Hands. You, you and your sausage fingers. It's so big and round. I can't imagine where you might want to put something like that. Oh, Dita, you've been bad. And then Zack Snyder gives us the saddest cover 
of Bad Moon Rising you have ever heard. <laughs> uh-huh. I mean, it's like, hey, here's some straight edge razor blades if you were thinking about slitting your wrist. Oh, thanks, <laughs> Army of the Dead. And it's just all of them, a montage of everyone checking their guns yeah. and getting their stuff ready to go for this. Right, But this should be fun. This is the part of it that should be like, oh, yeah, the, like our big no. adventure is about to start. I see the The ocean temperatures are rising by 1.1 degrees every year. I see troubles on the way. You know, there's more slavery today than there was over 200 years ago. (laughs) What are we doing? Stop it! It's head scratching. So then we see they arrive at like the big meet, right? And Guzman shows up and he's got two people with him I got two people you've never met uh this is my buddy his name is dead meat and uh this is uh my other female friend her name's short timer they're on my dime okay van and Dieter are just sniping at each other like oh van no you i like your saw but you you seem very wound up maybe you just need a massage or something and van's like hey like this kid this kid here he doesn't look like a zombie killer Right. And you're like, kid, Dieter clearly looks like he's in his early 30s. Oh, yeah, <sighs> at least. Dieter says, he was like, look, it is I, Dieter, who will open that which cannot be opened. I'm referring to the safe and not the zipper on your pants. But maybe I could accomplish both. Hmm? <laughs> And Tanaka shows up finally and has this ginormous model of the resort and casino that they're going to bust into. I like when he shows up, he does the golf clap, but he doesn't understand how to use a golf clap. Golf claps are sarcastic expressions of approval, Mm -hmm. but when he does it here and walking in... It's like you're kind of undermining the confidence of the team going in to do this thing. Also, why is Tanaka the one explaining the heist? If Dave Bautista is our Danny Ocean in this movie, shouldn't he be breaking this shit down and not Tanaka? Well, because then they would have agency in the film (sighs) and not just following this by the numbers routine that somebody else has sketched out for like at no point in the movie does something go wrong and they have to change it other than you know we'll get to the whole zombie queen and king thing in a minute but like everything that tanaka lays out for them to do they do it's not a problem right but it should but it should be because it's an oceans 11 movie and one of the big things in an oceans 11 movie is that you plan and then something at the last minute goes wrong that you have to adapt to get over you know to overcome How do you fuck this up so badly? As Tanaka is explaining the plan, which is you're going to shoot your way into Las Vegas. Now, please to be excusing me. I have a question. Um, How do we kill zombies? And then Dave Bautista (laughs) steps in and is like, well, it's pretty much all about the brain. You uh, take a gun, you shoot a bullet right through the head. And uh, that's what it. if Dita were to find something like maybe a large rock or a dictionary or something like this and smash the zombie in the head where the brain is located? Would that suffice to kill the zombie? Yeah, yes, it's fine. It's as Ex- long as the, the brain is destroyed, it's fine. All right, no further questions, please, Mr. Tanaka. Continue with your explanation for what's going to happen in our movie. And then they go in to the Bly, is you know, the stand in for the Bellagio. They go into the Bly, they're going to turn the generator back on open the vault after tripping some security measures tignataro is going to go get a helicopter that's on the roof of the casino they Uh open the safe load the money on the chopper and then fly off a day before the nuke is to go off even fucking up the ticking clock it's four days away well now we're down to three and later that gets truncated to two Mm -hmm. just make it a three-day thing and then you got to get in it you don't need to keep having like a sliding scale of when the bomb is going to hit it just they fuck the whole movie. All right. This is the point where Guzman's pal Dead Meat is like, <laughs> well, I'm out because this sounds like we're going into a highly dangerous situation and I want no part of it. So, And he gets in a car and leaves. First off, my immediate thought was, oh, they're going to kill him. He knows about the plot. He cannot get away. You have to exterminate this individual so that we have no loose ends. Mm-hmm. But they don't. Yeah, he just leaves. Well, then why introduce him, Bo? Uh, because the movie's got to be two and a half hours long, apparently. So why not waste our, everyone's time? Uh, but his, his sexy lady killer, short timer, she stays. And this is also where Mario's like, hey, 
look, I know that guy said he was out, but I'm all the way in, brother. I'm going with you guys just to make sure, you know, everything's cool. Uh, I'm definitely not uh, a plant. I'm not there to do anything nefarious. I'm not there to uh, have any kind of ulterior motive. I'm just there to make sure that you have the tools you need to be successful. I am the 13th man. I realize there's only like seven or eight of you. Maybe six. I don't know. I'm here. I'm not a fifth wheel. Like, I'm I'm the fifth wheel, but I'm the fifth wheel if you're one of the, the four main wheels gets a flat. Then you put me in, but I'm there. And also, just real quick, uh, I just want to go and clear. These TCB brand sunglasses, they're kind of my thing. So, nobody else wears sunglasses. Short timer, you got that red bandana. That's your thing. Glasses are my thing. Black guy, that's your thing. Uh, Dieter, your weird German guy, that's your thing. Walking thumb, your thing. Everybody's got a thing. Okay, so, I'm just saying, nobody else needs to wear gold rhinestone studded glasses except yours truly. It's my thing. And Tanaka asked Dave Bautista, you know, have you thought about how you're going to get in, Dave? Bautista says, yeah, I think I got that covered. Here's another fuck up, Bo. Tanaka should be the one saying, I have a way for you to get in. Because later, when there's the hookup between Mar and and the Coyote, then that connection would make sense. Mm -hmm. Here, the fact that Dave Bautista was the one who found the way in does not pave the way for the double cross. How do you screw this up so badly? It's so many points. There is a North Star. Follow that. And the whole movie is like, up this ramp? No, (laughs) idiot. This way. (laughs) Right. Every review for this movie should have just been no Spicoli. (laughs) But we cut to the Macquarie quarantine facility and Kate. And Dave Bautista shows up and we confirm that this is in fact his daughter. And he says, hey, I need some help getting in Las Vegas. And I'll give you $50 million. Oh my million God, what you are you do doing it. here? I am so embarrassed. You should tell me if you're going to show up at my work and just show up. I work at a quarantine. Look, I know we have a strained relationship, as happens in movies like this, but yes? I'm going to give you all of the money that I get for doing this. And Wait, whatever what? you want to do, if you want to save some kids or uh-huh. kill some kids right? or just have some kids dance for your entertainment, you can do that. And I know it'll uh-huh. be the right thing because you'll be the one doing it. So if I do you a favor, you're going to give me a lot of money yeah that's right hmm apple doesn't fall far from the tree dad i'm in and that's what happens bo she's just like you're gonna give me 15 million dollars oh yeah that's what's gonna happen all right (laughs) we get a quick scene where gita and some of her pals wake up coyote lily who we only glimpsed briefly earlier in the movie and she (laughs) pulls a gun on him immediately because of course she does she's living real high intensity and After she realizes that these are not, in fact, zombies that she has to murder, Gita says, we need to get in. And she says, you know, okay, maybe I will take you inside. Let's go. (laughs) You know, the thing of it is, like with Dave Bautista and the money, have Kate hook up with the mom or whatever to go into zombie zone. And then that's what's driving him to go in to do this thing so he can look for his daughter. Yeah, I don't care about the money. I care about my daughter. Right. Again, yet another branch in this film where you took the wrong path shitheads you know <laughs> yeah. like like he doesn't care about that he he's like i gotta make amends for my daughter she's in there yes then i have to go you know who wouldn't have made these choices nicholas cage in this movie oh absolutely not i've got to get my little girl i've got to save my daughter like you would be like oh here we go did you say not without my daughter with sally fields that only with zombies so there's a moment before they go in where van teaches dieter to shoot and it turns out he's really good at it. he's a great shot and like oh i like this little machine that uh, mm. i point it in his shoes it's like holding a little metallic penis in your hands as long as you're dental and you know how to squeeze it mr van you know how to make something come out the front how many pounds of pressure do you put on the penis <laughs> i know this is five pounds of pressure to make the bullet come out the scene but how do you how much pressure do you need to make something come out of the end of these uh, uh, i'm feeling things never felt before but we're not going to talk about this right now look how about we get some cheese and wine we i think i saw a, a mud puddle it's not exactly a sauna but we can give it a go but so kate shows up to give the team a ride to the quarantine zone which is a big bus and we get an overhead shot as this bus is passing a bunch of military vehicles headed the other direction as people are heading out of the Macquarie facility and and the area around Las Vegas. And we get yet another bummer 
<laughs> of a cover as an acoustic version of the end plays as performed by danish indie rock duo the ravenettes uh, I mean, it's, it's this is the end of my only friend the end. if you were going to kill yourself mm -hmm. there's a handful of songs you might want to play right mm -hmm. the end is in your top five like, along with what sinatra's my way peter gabriel's salisbury hill mm-hmm rem's everybody hurts mm -hmm. lou vega's mambo number no. five and grandma got run over by a reindeer <laughs> i would add to that list the monster mash has always been high on the list for me yeah how this movie didn't end with that song playing is a shocker the needle drop at the end of this movie we'll talk about it is fuck this movie is I so bad so on the way martin tries to make friends with our lady short timer yeah uh, who says like oh i don't trust you and guzman's like hey, hey that's the short timer i know and then the bus <laughs> pulls into this facility and they go to find coyote lily and as soon as kate takes them to coyote lily and she's like oh my god i did what i was supposed to do i'll see you when you get back for my 15 million dollars losers and kate leaves immediately after she's walking by a tent and here's a bunch of children crying and instead of doing the sensible thing which is to ignore that and then just right, stuff just it keep down. walking kate yeah, right she opens the door and she's like hey oh my god where's your mom gita you weird little <laughs> kids also get your my finger out of your mom's, nose also you smell like our, pee she's our mom's gone and kate's like are you kidding me jesus christ you know what coyote lady must have smuggled your mom back into the zombie zone and i bet she got killed this is bullshit i'll be goddamned if i'm raising you two. i mean look your mom's coming back she's definitely not dead you know what little fella put both put one finger in each nose and and keep them in there and by the time you take them out your mom's gonna be back all right i'm definitely not gonna be your new mom stay here all right i'll be right back Enjoy those nose You sister, ones. keep his fingers in his nose. We cut back to our team, and Van has to help Dieter put on his gear. He's like, oh, you're so strong. The way you tighten it around my waist, I like it. You do have very narrow hips. Feminine hips, but in a masculine kind of way. Well, you can call them whatever you want. I mean, I'm, I'm open to ideas. <laughs> but yes, I work out. I do a little yoga. A little light stretching. I can tell. I can tell you work out. The way you were handling that gun and... Oh, is it hot outside or is it just me? I mean, I get it's Las Vegas, but it feels hotter than normal. The question is, are you willing to gamble on love? It's, <laughs> so Kate shows up and immediately punches Coyote Lily. <laughs> It was like, hey, look, bitch, you took that mom lady from earlier in the movie into the zombie zone, didn't you? Look, and she didn't come back. She's got two kids and I'm not raising them. Look, I did not know she had the children. If I had known that, clearly I would not have done it. Unless, of course, she had given me more money. Then, of course, I would have taken her into the zombie zone. Everyone has a price, including myself. It's not very much. But, you know, a pack of cigarettes, potentially. A bottle of wine, a loaf of bread. There's an old <laughs> saying among coyotes, uh, a little vino would be kino. You give me a, a basket full of kittens, I am the coyote. How can I say no to that? Kate says, listen, you hussy, I am coming with you to find Gita. <laughs> There's no way I'm raising those two weird kids. The daughter's eyes are cockeyed. And what's crazy is that the cockeye switches day to day. It moves with the place of the moon or some shit and dave bautista pulls her aside he's like listen there's no way you're coming i and guess i am she says look mr man i will sneak in right after you if you don't know you're not you, and i'm probably no, gonna die not. i'm gonna be honest no. with you i suck no. at this no no well no how about no. yes have you no, thought of yes? you are not L listen to me i am putting my foot down right now i am dave bautista you are my daughter there is no way you are ever going into the zombie zone with us. All right. Brunk, bonk. You know, and of course she's going in. Before they leave, though, <laughs> Coyote Lily goes to porn stash and is like, hey, you that is always uh, raping and hitting on the women of the camp. Um, <laughs> would you like to come make $20,000? And porn stash is like, $20,000? Why? What do I have to do? And she's like, oh, nothing much. You just come with us inside uh, the quarantine zone for a minute. <clears> and <throat> yeah, baby. Have a, a yeah. distinct odor. Oh. 
that yeah. maybe appeals to maybe yeah. not humans, but something. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I I hear where you're coming from. L- let me ask you a question: Do I need my rectal thermometer for a strip? That's what I call my penis because I I put it in people's butts, yeah. taking temperature with my penis. Am I gonna need that, girl? <laughs> this is disgusting, but I like it. So why don't you bring your thermometer? With you into Las Vegas, and you will come with me for $20,000, and I will maybe touch your thermometer. Does it have to be rectal? Could it be oral? Hmm? Yeah, that's your question. You don't shave your pits, do you? No, I like that. No, I am French. Why would I? <laughs> yeah, I can raise my arm, and everyone in the camp will be able to tell immediately where I am. <laughs> It is a bit like a personal sauna, only in reverse. <laughs> Coyote Lily then escorts them over to this shipping container that she just raises up and they walk through. It's got a bunch of chandeliers hanging from it. It looks very pleasant. And then she opens the other side and they just walk right into zombie world. It is the chintziest. It's not super secret. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that's the door into zombie world right there. The one that says Zombie World Entrance? Yeah, just go through there. Yeah. Like, okay. And once they enter, Coyote Lily says, These paths of dead corpses, they are the shamblers. They wither in the sun, but they come back to life when it rains. You would think that that is something that might happen later in our movie, but it does not. Why do I mention it here? I do not know. Um, I did not write this terrible film. You can bring that up with Mr. Zack Snyder if you have a question. And then Martin approaches Coyote Lily and says, Hey, so I am led to believe that you know your way around this place. And uh, what do you know about zombies? Everything. I know everything about zombies. If you have a question, ask me. I am a walking encyclopedia of zombie knowledge. Good to know. How did I learn all of this? It does not matter. What is my background? Who cares? I am the expert on zombies, according to me. Probably not (laughs) anything I need to uh, use later in the movie, but... You know, good to know, good to know. Which is crazy because she's not an expert on zombies either. No, 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 no. (laughs) She knows enough to not get killed immediately. Guzman and his friend Short Timer, they're taking selfies and sticking out their tongues and throwing peace signs. They're like, okay, whatever they have to. I was amazed at how all of the characters in this film are so two-dimensional. It's shocking how underdeveloped they are. We keep coming back to this, how lazy the writing is in this movie, that it is unnecessarily elaborate where it doesn't need to be, and it's too thin in the places where it needs some texture. Yeah. Off in the distance, they hear a velocity, or excuse me, a zombie approaching, but it's not just any zombie boat. It's a tiger zombie, and this tiger zombie leaps up on some wrecked cars that are on the strip. They're looking at the main strip of Las Vegas, and it just looks like, you know, a battlefield. A lot of the crew, as they watch this, they head over, and I notice that they have these gasoline containers on their backs that are clearly empty, because there is no way that you can leap and shoulder roll the way these people do with five to eight gallons of helicopter fuel strapped to your back right Uh, so we are introduced to valentine the zombie tiger it had a name yeah 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 coyote lily says this tiger it was one of siegfried and roy's tigers and then it became zombie clearly this was the tiger that was used as the model for the primary character in the dreamworks animated series king of the pride pride of the king Something like this. I think John Goodman was involved, but in the unfortunate incident where Siegfried or Roy got eaten by a tiger, they killed all of the tigers except this one. They kept it around due to legal reasons, but now he's a zombie. So, Father of the Pride, that's what it was called. I was thinking King of the Hill. I always get those two mixed up. One has tigers, one has rednecks. That's what it was. And there's a running gag that starts here where Martin thinks that it's an abomination. It's like, that thing is fucked up, y'all. I hate that. I mean, I, I zombie people him. is one thing, but this tiger, it can suck my balls. Coyote Lily walks over to Officer Pornstash and she says, excuse me, uh, Pornstash, may I see your gun? <laughs> no, no, no. Your real gun. Thank you. Let me touch it. Let me stroke it. This is very nice. And then she says a little bit closer. She then shoots him in the leg. Mm-hmm. 
zip ties his hands and his feet and she says everyone we have to make a trade with the zombies this is how it works the super fast smart zombies they are the alphas they are smarter faster and way more organized think like six million dollar man but maybe i don't know six thousand dollar man that's what they're like this is their kingdom and we play by their rules okay we've got to leave a piece of shit out here for them and then they will let us walk about freely wherever we want to go she tells the rest of them to hide Uh while porn stash lay screaming in the dust please don't kill me i got a mother we all have mothers you fucking cunt you are a rapist who loads power over other women fuck you you piece of shit that is actual dialogue from this movie yes she calls him a cunt and a rapist fuck you and she calls him a piece of shit which he is Uh huh but it really is reflective of the harsh tone of this movie Uh uh-huh you don't oh, need sure. cunt thrown around in a movie about a casino heist with zombies. Right. And and it's not Scottish. <laughs> where where the word better. is used like a comma in day-to-day language. <laughs> it should have made her Scottish. But then they would have had a hard time explaining that. Well. Maybe not. They don't explain anything else. Right. I mean, is it an easier time explaining why she's Canadian French or whatever? I, I don't know. At this point, the zombie queen shows up. And this is where the movie takes a turn for the truly stupid. <laughs> yes. And it is with this nonsense mythology of the zombies. Where Go on. you have a zombie queen who appears to have been a former dancer in Vegas. Because she's still yes. wearing low heel pumps and her <laughs> fancy dance outfit. Well, that's why she's the queen. And then there's a dude with her that's sort of like the zombie first mate. Who yeah. isn't the He's king. like a bodyguard or something. Yeah. So they screech a little bit and they sniff porn stash and then they just grab him and drag him off. This is also the point I, in the notes where I talk about how awful all this out of focus bullshit looks in the movie. I hate We haven't touched hate. on this hate how it looks it feels like you just got out of a public pool where whoever's running it has added five times more chlorine than's needed to keep the thing piss free it feels like maybe all the characters in the background have their dicks out and they're blurring it out to keep this from getting an nc-17 rating it is really off-putting it feels like they're blurring out the logos of companies that did not agree to be in this film regularly I know that he stated, Snyder stated, that this was supposed to make it feel more dreamlike and all. It just looks like hot garbage. It looks so bad. It looks cheap. And because you're using this alongside a lot of digital effects, it makes the digital effects look even cheaper, too. It's awful. This movie looks so, so bad. Coyote Lily gives her theories about what happens because, as you pointed out, she doesn't really understand what's going on here. Because all she says is, yes, all the zombies seem to stay in the Olympus, which, you know, it's a nice place. What are you going to do? But you come out of there, one of these alpha zombies, which means something is happening in there that I have not seen. So, you know, maybe they make you one of their members with like a hazing of some kind maybe they spank you on the bottom with a wooden paddle when they bite you yes. i don't know i said i know everything about zombies look that may have been a wee little white lie okay i don't know everything i don't know if they have hobbies i don't know if they have currency i don't know if they have established laws around crime on punishment if they love if they live if they laugh i don't know i know what i know but i don't know what i don't know kill me okay i am the coyote and i will help you first off we have to get off of the streets okay we gave them the pawn stash with the gunshot wounded leg we need to get indoors follow me and so they all follow the coyote lily and as they go into this building there's a billboard that's real prominent featuring the magic of larry fong and you're like oh i bet that's somebody and it turns out he's a cinematographer of the movie and you're like <laughs> isn't that fun yeah i didn't even look it up i knew it was something like that and i was like i can't be bothered i don't care enough <laughs> At this point, computer-generated Tig Notaro, she does a little riffing about how Martin shouldn't be allowed to live and that he's just there to keep 
tabs on the crew. And this kind of goes on and on. And then the movie heads back over to Porn Stash, and he's surrounded by all these alpha zombies. And Queen Zombie shows up, and everybody's howling, and then Bo King Zombie shows up. And it turns out he's that military soldier from the start of the movie. Now, we know this because he looks nothing like that character from the start of the movie. Uh, His hair is extremely long now. He's Mm -hmm. way more gruesome. I think he's a different color. But he has somehow maintained the dog tags around his neck. So if you've watched this movie twice twice Bo. I sat through this movie two times. Mm -hmm. That's where you know oh, that's our patient zero of all of this trouble. King Zombie has not gotten a haircut which apparently is something you have to do as a zombie because unlike everything I ever learned about corpses, your hair continues to grow. Dave Bautista's hair grows and then shrinks in this movie. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. I think that's uh, what you call reshoots. What's up with the top of his head? You can kind of see his brain coming through his skull, Mm -hmm. or it looks like he has cornrows tattooed on his scalp. If you want an answer to this question, I do not know steroids Uh, one presumes like i think dave bautista is fun enough uh especially in those guardians of the galaxy movies and i thought he was real charming even on that christmas special but he does not need to be the emotional lead of a movie whenever he starts crying in this it does look like he's about to sneeze it also makes me kind of sad and not in the way that the movie wants me to be sad but in the way of like oh i'm sad that i'm watching this and i feel bad for dave bautista because he does not have the chops for this kind of thing no you know he's great at comedy he's actually very funny how crazy is it that the wwe is the pipeline for action movie stars these days from him and the rock and who's that other guy john cena back in the day it was like i guess what you got bodybuilders or martial arts experts but now it's just professional wrestlers because you have i guess a built-in audience and you're gonna go watch him in a movie and it also shows that you've got some level of charisma you know stage you, presence right. and you know what the hell's going on yeah and you yeah. can work on your feet a little bit because some of that stuff is improvised and i don't think it's ridiculous it like no. i don't watch wrestling so i don't know these characters or these people very well but i get it it's not the craziest thing it it makes more sense than bodybuilders quite frankly because at least there's an element of performance in in front of an audience like stage actors it's still nonsense but Oh, also one thing that we we kind of skipped over that I just want to point out. At one point when they're talking about this business in the Olympus where like, King Zombie and Queen Zombie and all the other zombies live, Kate is like, oh my God, that's probably where Gita is. Let's go. And everybody's like, no, yeah, that's absolutely. So I bet she's in that building right there. Yeah. Of all the hotels on the strip, she's probably in that one. King Zombie shows up. Uh-huh. And he's making all these dinosaur noises like, clack, 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 you know, and he goes over and gives Queen Zombie some Eskimo kisses. And then he bends down and puts his ear to her, her belly, implying that she's pregnant. Mm-hmm. I'll bet zombie sex stinks real bad and dangerous for at least one of them because you could lose pieces of yourself like that so long story short king zombie bites porn stash and he becomes an alpha zombie but none of this matters to the movie at all he shows up later in the film but it's just it doesn't matter yeah you could have edited that out it doesn't matter so coyote lily leads our crew through a hotel lobby that's full of zombies and they're all hibernating and then dave bautista says Hey, I'll make a path with these glow sticks that I had left over from Halloween. I hand them out instead of candy as a healthy alternative. And then Short Timer turns to Martin, because remember, they had beef from the bus. And she says, you go first. I don't trust you. And then all of this crew, they weave in and out of these hibernating zombies, like they're going through like a meat locker and just this is just hanging beef. And then along the way, Martin reaches down and picks up a glow stick and just tosses it off to the side. Why is he doing this? I don't know. He just does it like Short Timer. So Short Timer comes behind him and she sees the glow stick that has been misplaced and follows it down a slightly different path. So you're like, oh, Short Timer's in trouble. She follows this glow stick and then along the way as the other crew is going, some pans fall off a shelf. So apparently we are in an industrial kitchen beneath this hotel and they go clink, clink, clink. And then Short timer is in trouble because the zombies kind of wake up and they kind of sort of attack her but she just starts battling the shit out of these zombies one by one how is it that short timer 
a character that was tacked on at the 11th hour has more character development, agency, and purpose in this movie than arguably anyone else in this film. It's a fine question. She suddenly becomes the most important character in the movie. Yeah. And then immediately isn't well she makes her way through all these zombies she gets to a door where she can escape and martin who we've already established as a dick he takes a tray stand like a folding tray stand and sticks it in the handles of the door on the other side so she can't get out and you're like oh shit r.i.p short timer like that's why they call her short timer because she's dead so the whole crew march march marches along and Bo out of fucking nowhere short timer explodes through a window because she is a total badass shooting zombies left and right and immediately i'm like this is awesome she is going to (laughs) fuck up martin for being a traitor but then i realized oh this is a Zack snyder movie and any ember of hope and optimism that springs up must be immediately doused with a bucket full of tears from orphans so she of course gets bit by a number of zombies and guzman who gives her i guess a hero's funeral a viking funeral of sorts shoots the gas tank on her back which explodes killing her and a bunch of the other zombies and basically gets them free of this danger that is not what happens when you shoot a gas container first off the bullet is not hot enough to ignite the gasoline And also, there's not enough oxygen in the tank to make it burn. I learned this from Mythbusters. Nice. It just doesn't work that way. It's bullshit. If that's the case, like, have her carrying C4. Have her carrying something like, oh, you need to be careful. If this gets damaged, it will blow you up. But, all right. Details matter. They just do. It does, but in a different movie that's a little sillier, I wouldn't care. But because this movie takes itself so seriously, you know, the knives are This is the end. (laughs) yeah so inside like after the death of short timer they shoot a few more zombies and then they're okay again you know they're they're free and kate asks coyote lily oh my god you think gita really is alive and lily (laughs) gives her a definite i don't know maybe (laughs) i one time i brought the guy in that got taken to the olympus and then he got away and i thought it was pretty crazy he said he got shoved in the room with two other people who were taken one at a time from the room by some zombies and then he was okay i mean he little fucked up in the head but what are you going to do is in a zombie hotel for two days <laughs> i also want to point out everybody in this movie is a sharpshooter the number of headshots in this film are exquisite mm-hmm. that's all they shoot are zombies and their melons like you said the the in a different movie that wouldn't matter because it was just so silly and so of course they're all sharpshooters dave bautista and the crew they come across another group of dead guys who have blueprints inside the hotel and dave bautista says oh the slimy bastard tanaka he sent a team before us martin do you know anything about this and martin's like well br- me brother <laughs> Well, what was the question? Hey, hey, I got an idea. Let's all split up into small groups. Safety in small numbers. That's right. Isn't that how it works? <laughs> but this is the execution of the plan, right? Like, so Dave Bautista is like, Kate, how about you come with me? We'll take care of these generators on the third floor. Oh my God. I can't wait to go with my dad. And then Dieter <laughs> tells Van like, hey, how about you come with me? Maybe we'll go downstairs, look at the vault. And they go, <laughs> Guzman tags along for a sexy threesome for that group. And then Dave Bautista is like, Maria, you need to go computer generated to, to the roof to get the helicopter going. Don't worry. You only have to be there for a couple seconds and you can leave her because she's going to be all alone due to pending litigation outside of the scope of this movie. It is like when they would insert Billy Crystal into those Oscar montages. <laughs> 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 he's like talking to indiana jones and whatnot like you might as well have her talking to bogey from casablanca it's like weird al interviewing <laughs> britney spears <laughs> right right <laughs> if al tv and those billy crystal montages had a baby <laughs> It would be this. It's so silly. Martin fakes Dieter out by handing him an access card to some security closet or something, and then hands him one anyway. Martin goes to hand him one, Dieter reaches for it, and it goes zip, and it's on a little zip tied to your waist. And I'm like, we already know that Martin is a dick. We don't need him pulling like practical jokes here. 
Yeah, yeah, and also it's such a weird detail for this character that he is both deceitful, which we know, but also kind of playful about it, but doesn't really I just, come I up again. I just, I hate this movie so much, and it comes from all different fronts. <laughs> <laughs> Everywhere you turn, something terrible is happening. So Cody, Lily, and Martin go outside and kind of dodge Valentine, who's stalking around. The tiger. Yeah. And there's some real aliens stuff here, because this movie doesn't have an original bone in its stupid body, where Martin is like, oh, that thing is terrible, dude. I hate that thing. And she says, yes, but you don't see the zombies uh, fucking each other over? And the rules are clear, you know? This is not a bad thing, necessarily. I mean, I don't want to be a zombie or anything, but I'm just saying, it is not the worst way to live. It's a total call back to that aliens moment of you don't see them fucking each other or over for a job and right. it's almost the exact same line it drives me crazy again don't make me think of a better movie when i'm watching your terrible one please there's so many reasons to hate this movie just take your pick coyote lily fires a gun to call the zombie queen and now they're waiting for her to show up because apparently that is the pavlovian ringing the dinner bell for these zombies martin does ask coyote lily he says hey let me ask you a question did you shoot that mom lady kate was talking about in the leg and leave her out there like you did porn stash and coyote lily says no it did not i actually lost her i never uh, leave anyone behind also if you cross me i will shoot you twice in the eyes you are a piece of shit uh why would you shoot me twice just a uh, quick question it's the thing that i do i shoot people twice that's how they know it is me one is so you do not become zombie number two is just for fun you know <laughs> he's just good time we cut to Dave Bautista and he's pouring a gas container into the backup generator for this hotel what's that gonna do Bo it's like four gallons of gas yeah right for a casino sorry right? yes <laughs> so Dave Bautista says oh, look Kate I'm sorry that I killed your mom in front of you when I stuck that knife in her head like I was opening up a pumpkin at Halloween and Kate says oh my god you think that's why I haven't been talking to you the past three years I never blamed you for killing my mom mom i'm pissed off at you because you never showed up after that you were never there for me you didn't comfort me you didn't show up on my birthday you didn't like any of my posts on instagram you haven't even commented on one tiktok you're like the biggest piece of shit dad or stepdad or uncle or whatever you are to me ever you know i was thinking maybe after this over i can start a food truck and just have a life. Yeah, I guess that sounds good, but I mean, I kind of don't care because I've spent so much time hating you. I can't just turn it off like a faucet, stupid bald thumb guy. What if I opened up a food truck and I sold artisan grilled cheeses? I, I could call it Dave Balchistas. So I was thinking, or maybe make America great again, G-R-A-T, and I would like hand grate the cheese for all the sandwiches. I get it, it's a little bit polarizing in today's political climate, but I was also thinking maybe I could call it, I cut the cheese and I would slice each piece of cheese to order. Kate, what do you think? I could have a grilled cheese called the Kate. I'm going to tell you, I totally stopped listening after the first one because you can't improve on perfection, okay? You started with a showstopper. David... <laughs> Bautista is our winner. But also, I hate you. Dave Bautista, he pours two and a half gallons of gas into this generator to fire up uh, the power for this casino, and it works. And then Guzman, Dieter, and Vanderhoe, they head down to the vault, and they shoot a few random zombies on their way. And then outside the vault, there are these Indiana Jones-style booby traps that apparently took out a team that were trying to previously do what they are doing. And then Vanderhoe, he's spouting off all of this philosophical nonsense about how they might be in this infinite loop and that the dead people there are really them in a different timeline again all of this is here to just confuse you but it ultimately ends with Vanderhoe placing bombs on the grate of metal which explode when he detonates them and it opens up their pathway forward towards the vault outside Martin and Coyote Lily they see the zombie queen and her zombie bodyguard number two return to the city streets the movie then heads back to Dieter, who's like, oh yes, there are booby traps on the floor. We need something to trigger it. And Van's like, oh, I've got an idea, Dieter. I'll be right back. And he runs over the elevator, ding, and he heads up to the main floor. We get a cutaway from that to the zombie king showing up and grabbing one of Gita's friends from this room where Gita is being held, which begs the question, why hold them and not porn stash? 
I don't know. Because it's terrible. So then the zombie queen and the zombie first mate can't find a corpse after they got called by Coyote Lily. And so they start running for Coyote Lily and Martin. And Martin fires Ebola out of this crazy gun he's got that ties the zombie queen up and drops her to the ground. Zombie first mate makes it to Martin, but then gets killed when Coyote Lily shoots him in the head and coyote lily says what are you doing ma and i thought that you just needed a vial of the zombie queen's blood that's not what we agreed to and martin says yeah but man if i cut her head off we can make like a whole zombie army that'd be badass and this was the moment i was like wait when did these two get in cahoots with one another dave bautista was the one who made the deal with kate to have coyote lily get everybody into zombie land i don't know all of a sudden they've got this side deal going on that you don't know about also the zombie king when the head gets cut off senses some weird disturbance in the force or something yeah because martin pulls out a is it a groat yeah and he just saws off the zombie queen's head and then when he pops off her head it's like he raided zombies magic box in Wee's playhouse it looks like a prop from evil dead too because even though he cut off her head it's still like i'm gonna kill you i saw you so i saw you so it's very silly coyote lily does say like oh you've really stood up a hornet's nest now the zombie king is going to be coming soon he's going to be looking for you and the head of the woman that he loves so much well, so what what's he gonna do about it and she's like i do not know he is very upset when he sees his zombie queens that have only been a handful every time he gets really upset when someone takes off their heads down in the vault van shows up with a zombie strapped to a dolly and this zombie is going to be the guinea pig to walk through these movie traps and he lets the guy go and this zombie immediately turns around and heads towards Dieter to kill him so van shoots the zombie the van heads up to get another zombie comes back but this time they microwave a hand of a human and toss it out on the floor where the booby traps are as bait to which i wanted to know where is this microwave bow on the casino floor i guess or down near the vault in the break the vault break room what and also it when he throws the hand to lure the zombie towards all the booby traps he says oh it's not human flesh that he's after it's the heat it's not the smell of us it, it's the the heat of it which then presumes that zombies have some kind of infrared vision or something it, you're right it's a detail that should have been left out but they didn't this zombie wanders across the floor with these booby traps and the first round is a bunch of poison darts that just thunk, 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 shoot out from the side of the walls uh-huh. then the next wave are a bunch of muzzles from guns that fill the zombie with bullets and then the final phase are just two giant walls that come in together and smash the zombie into goo dude this whole thing was designed by french archaeologist balak uh <laughs> who's like, once again we show there is nothing that you can booby trap that i cannot protect or whatever it is nonsense there is no world in which like this is the silliness part of of the movie that if it leaned into that that's fine yes but they don't right the tone is careening to let's watch a cgi zombie get squooshed to let's have this heavy moment between father and daughter and also the zombie king is going to be real mad now and it's just it's too much it's and all of it is misguided Yes. There's a quick cutaway to Tignataro where she is on the plane in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. And then she gets off that and she's like, oh my goodness, this helicopter won't start. Dude, she's cracking jokes to nobody. Yeah. It's like when Dangerfield was making those wise ass remarks on The Simpsons and he's like, who the hell am I talking to? (laughs) Like, what are you doing? I get that you're talking to the audience, but in reality, you're a crazy person. (laughs) <laughs> also, Guzman sees a thing where they have announced that they're going to step up the bomb. They're going to drop the bomb 24 hours early. The whole crew is just took a break to watch the news on TV. Yeah. See what's happening, what's going on with sports, local weather. And this newscaster says, the president has decided to allow the nuclear weapon to be dropped a day earlier. This is a quote from the movie. He did say it would be really cool if it was on the 4th of July as the ultimate firework show. But we need to create some urgency to move it up so it's happening a day early. And then the timer goes from a day and a half to an hour and 38 minutes. 
Mm-hmm. Why are you doing this? So everyone in the crew is just like, what the fuck? Rightfully so. And then at this point, they got to really like tighten things up. So we cut to computer generated Tignataro. She's banging on this helicopter with this oversized wrench like Chewbacca trying to get the Millennium Falcon working. And the helicopter bow literally catches on fire. Mm -hmm. She sprays it with this extinguisher to get things under control or to prevent them from getting any worse. Dude, this helicopter looks like the airborne equivalent of that rental car from Act 3 of Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. (laughs) Do do you think this thing will fly? You know, I know it's not much to look at, but yes, yes, I do. Funny as that may seem, with all this mess, you know what? The radio is the only thing that is really working good. It's clear as a bell. Don't ask me. Oh, they go down to tell Dieter that they, he has to hurry up. And he's like, oh, you have made me screw up again. If you do it one more time, this thing is closed forever. And yeah. you think like, oh, this is going to be a thing. But then he just gets it open. Uh-huh. This whole thing feels like it should have had more tension to opening the vault. But he, yeah, you're right. I need 60 minutes to open the vault. Click. It's open. Yeah. Meanwhile, the zombie king rides a zombie horse. Yes. To find the the zombie queen's body and Uh, puts his head to her belly and screams. Implying that the zombie baby is dead. Dude, the first time I saw this, and even when I was watching it again for the first time before I did notes, I had forgotten about this. And so I was like, wait a second, is there a baby in that zombie? Yeah. And then I thought, no, 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 that's too stupid. That's a terrible, terrible idea. (laughs) Shame on you. I know. (laughs) We come back to the crew and Dave Bautista and Kate, they find this ladder that leads up the wall to an open hatch. Kate climbs up to see if they can escape this way. And Dave Bautista says, Hey, how how about a food truck with tofu? I can make anything with tofu, like tofu burgers or tofu fries or tofu milkshakes or tofu cheesecake. I was thinking that I could call my food truck disgusting shit nobody will eat. What do you think about that, Kate? Kate's up top and she just sticks a zombie corpse hand in the opening of this metal grate to lodge it open. And she goes, we're secure. And having watched this movie twice, I'm still not sure what's going on here or why she did this. I don't know that this matters at all anywhere in the film. I wish I could tell you, (laughs) give you some indication. I have no idea. Apparently, along the way, the team just randomly picked up stacks of money here and there. And at this point, they're putting it into one of those automatic money counting machines. Why are they counting the random money they picked up? I don't know. But you can put a pin in that for a moment. Just keep in mind that there is a money counting machine. Mm-hmm. And then King Zombie, he takes the headless corpse of his queen back to the Olympus Hotel to all the other alphas. Dieter, uh, who has opened the safe and all but had an orgasm on himself, he has Van swing the door open to be part of this dramatic moment. And everyone marvels at Dieter's accomplishment. Coyote Lily, she looks over and she picks up that money counting machine that we just put a pin in. And she's like, mm, this feels like it's always the, the same uh, amount as a decapitated zombie zombie queen perhaps i shall take it with me (laughs) yes then we have the moment with the zombie king as the all the zombies kind of worshipfully watch him lead this headless body sure and then he digs into her belly Uh pulls out a zombie baby that's glowing blue yep and then that glow fades. He yeah. screams, and then all the other zombies start screaming. Th- that's because, Bo, we just had a moment of elation where they opened up the vault. Like, they accomplished their goal. So we have to immediately shit on that with an impromptu zombie C-section to pull out a dead zombie baby. Dude, this is easily the dumbest thing in this movie. It, because Says it, you. It just creates too many questions, right? Just sperm live in the testicles of a zombie and how did this happen is it some sort of immaculate conception kind of thing where zombie jesus will arrive and i know it's not terrible it's so bad dave bautista and maria remember the mechanic who hasn't really done anything in this movie Uh they decide to have a little lover's quarrel for no good reason and maria says i didn't come here for the money i came here for you dave bautista seeing you at my garage brought it all back what does that mean i don't know but i thought maybe you and me could have a life together and dave bautista says i thought i I fucked up forever you know you and me and then was me and kate my daughter and i was thinking about opening a food truck that only sells star wars themed donuts called 
do or do not. There is no try, but I would give out samples because of the try part. But, but I'm just, I'm really lost, you know? That's a terrible idea, but I love you. And you're like, what did, where did this come from? Hey, where's Kate? Has anybody seen Kate, my daughter? And then we cut to Kate, who's on the city streets hiding in a van. Why is she there? Who knows? We last saw her in the vault celebrating with everybody else. Zombie King is riding around on a zombie horse with a zombie tiger nearby. All the alphas are screaming and jumping around, looking for revenge to take out on some who is clearly hiding in the Bly Hotel because whatever kate runs into the olympus hotel because it's now zombie free because she's looking for the mom of those kids that she doesn't want to raise dave bautista is back at the Bly hotel he's like kate kate he's like oh god damn it i don't know where she went she went to the olympus looking for that mom of those kids she don't want to raise and maria says dave bautista i'm not gonna let you go alone and they share a moment Bo, where you feel like they're really connecting emotionally and dave bautista says thank you maria this is such a beautiful moment between us. Seems like this is a good time that the writer and director of this movie should come in and fuck it up for everybody. Ding! Yeah. The elevator opens. A zombie steps out, grabs Maria's head, spins her skull around, and kills her instantly. Also, the part of her spine comes out of her back when this happens. I like that the zombies take the elevator. I also like that rather than bite her, they just twist her head off. You think they went up to the elevator like, oh, up or down, down, ding. They get inside. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, 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 the deep rising gag. Music. Am I right? Mm. <laughs> What is this? The girl from Eponema. Ah, oh, yes. You are always good at music, Jeopardy. How have we not done Deep Rising? I know, I know. There's so much trash. Let's wrap this one up. Yes, please. We're so close. So Maria's dead. Uh Uh-huh, yeah. Spoilers! Pretty much everybody in this movie dies. People die in this movie that you don't expect to die. Actually, everybody dies. Yeah, that's kind of the theme for zombie movies in general. Like, even that Dawn of the Dead, the Snyder one, ends in a way that's like, oh, they're all dead. So Dave Bautista sees his one true love, Maria, question mark, get killed via uh, chiropractor mistakes. And he just goes like full crazy. He starts stabbing and shooting zombies left and right. He pokes one in the head with a knife, just like he did his wife. And then behind him, the rest of the crew is watching it like, oh shit, that looks dangerous. Maybe we should step in. Nah, just leave him alone. So there's more fighting and Dave Bautista, he never gets bit, but he kills off all the zombies. And then Dieter and Vanderhoe, they're like, maybe we should go back and get the money or something at this point martin our turncoat bad guy he rushes over to the escape ladder and he gets out the top and then he locks it so that nobody else can get out and coyote lily says let us out of here and martin says man tanaka doesn't give a shit about the money he wants this zombie head he can use it to create his own zombie army you moron actually he says au revoir moron and then he disappears so The zombie king shows up in this bunker and Van and the zombie king go mono e zombo. Yeah, it's 1920s bare knuckle Donnie Brook boxing style. (laughs) Yeah. Put up your dukes. And the zombie king pretty handily just beats the ever living shit out of this guy. Yeah, without biting him. Right. Until Dieter shows up with a pipe or something and clocks the zombie king on the head. And then he pushes Van into the vault to save him. That's and then right. Dieter closes the vault door. I'm like, Dieter, get in the vault with Van. What are you doing, stupid? But instead, he just gets pulled off by the zombie king. And that's the last we see of him. Like, we don't actually get a solid death for this character. No. Which is kind of crazy for him being such a major character and i guess the idea is that maybe he would be in a sequel or something but i don't know i don't it's really strange so van is inside the vault keep that in mind yes coyote lily grabs van's zombie saw and she starts to cut a hole in the wall because martin blocked their escape through the open hatch and she ends up cutting a hole and everybody can get out so then martin he runs off with his bag full of zombie zombie queen head but he's like hey man wait a minute 
This don't feel like the same weight of a zombie queen head. And he opens it up. You're like, oh shit, it's that money counting machine. And then about this time, the zombie tiger shows up on a ledge behind Martin and the zombie tiger attacks and kills Martin. And this reminded me a lot of when Dennis Nedry got killed in Jurassic Park for stealing that can of shaving cream. Mm -hmm. Although here, Martin's death is way more violent and visually R-rated. Yes. Nothing is left to the imagination. He gets tossed hither and yon and finally gets chomped on the head. And it's a long scene of him just getting ate up. Thanks a lot, Zack Snyder. I really needed 84 seconds of this guy getting eaten by a zombie tiger. We go to these tunnels where Coyote Lily, Guzman, and Dave Bautista are fighting their way out, and then they bust through the wall and make a run for this elevator to get to the roof. They're shooting. There's mayhem. Guzman gets got pretty unceremoniously while money floats around him. And yeah. he dies by pulling some pins on grenades that he's wearing on his chest, which blows the shit out of everything isn't it crazy how undeveloped all these characters are yeah i mean it's hard to feel anything for the characters when they go because you don't really care yeah. about anybody so no you know i mean the closest you get is martin because you just dislike him so when he gets got it's like okay good the the real jerk sure. of the movie gets it but mm. yeah the way the way when he handed off that security card and like zip back to his waist that's a dick move of course you deserve to have your head crushed by a zombie tiger so dave bautista and coyote lily get to the elevator and there is an actual music joke here where do you really want to hurt me plays uh -huh. the zombie king shows up at the casino in time to see all of his zombie minions dead and on fire and murdered and that kind of thing so he's gonna be a real handful but i have a question for you yeah. What's Kate up to right now? Oh, she's at the Olympus and <laughs> uh, zombie porn stash has arrived sniffing around for her. And But we'll get back to her in a minute. There's just a quick cutaway to her like, oh, remember Kate in this movie? And you're like, I right, guess. Right, right. <laughs> Dave Bautista, he makes it to the roof with Coyote Lily and the helicopter still isn't working. Zombie King shows up and Coyote Lily, she reaches into her bag and pulls out the zombie queen's head and she puts a gun to it as a threat to the zombie king. And she says, hold it. Coyote Lily gets it. The next zombie move, the zombie queen's going to get it. And the zombie king says, hold it, man. She's not bluffing. <laughs> And then <laughs> Coyote Lily says, I'll hold him, Dave Bautista. Are you getting the helicopter and go? So computer generated uh, Tignataro, she finally gets the helicopter working. She flies away with Dave Bautista, leaving Coyote Lily to sacrifice herself as the zombie king, like javelins, a piece of rebar through her shoulder, pinning her to a wall. But then Coyote Lily has the final say-so in this situation, and she just chunks the zombie queen's head off the side of this building. It splats like a rotten pumpkin on the sidewalk, and the zombie king, he just, like, bites into Coyote Lily. So I don't know if she turns into a zombie or what's going on there. One guesses, but, I, I mean, what's it matter? Because this whole place is going up, so... Right. I mean, who cares? Yeah. We cut to Kate, who now has a gun and she stumbles into a room and finds that mom that she's been looking for. Dave Bautista is in the helicopter with computer-generated Tignataro, and he says, Hey, we've only got nine minutes. We need to go to the Olympus Hotel to save my daughter, Kate. And I'm like, no, no, you don't. You need to leave this city. You have nine minutes before this place gets blown up with a nuclear weapon. Mm -hmm. Leave now. And then, Chad, we have this whole extended sequence where Kate is looking around the Olympus for Gita and ultimately finds her while Dave Bautista and computer-generated Tignataro make it to the roof of the Olympus. And Dave Bautista, in another Aliens moment with Ellen and, and Bishop, says, Hey, don't screw me. You better be here when I get back. I've got to go search this massive hotel and find my daughter in less than nine minutes so that we could all escape together. And he just goes room by room going, Kate, Kate, are you in here? Oh, she's not here. Kate, are you in this room? I oh, she's not in here. Kate? Do I have any extra gas on me? Maybe I can put it in the generator. I, I should fire up this casino too. Kate eventually leaves the room with this mom and one of the other women who hasn't been turned into an alpha. And then porn stash zombie for no apparent reason. He shows up and I think he bites the extra lady, but that doesn't matter. Then Kate shoots porn stash 
zombie in the head and kills him. Mm -hmm. Good for her, bad for him. Dave Bautista hears all this guy in fire. He runs down. More zombies arrive, including King Zombie, which, Bo, how did King Zombie get here so fast? Dave Bautista and computer-generated Tig Notaro, they flew in a helicopter to get to this hotel. King Zombie was just back at the Bly. Now he's over here at the Olympia? Well, zombie horses don't have to stop and get water. It's so stupid. I hate this movie so much. Just set the movie in one hotel. You don't need two hotels. We got to go into the the lion's den to get this money. Right, right. dummies. Also, Zombie King has a metal helmet that he wears so that if you try to (laughs) shoot him in the head, it just kapings off of it. Correct. And so the Zombie King tracks down Kate and Gita, who are at the end of the hall in this Olympus hotel and he starts running for them. Dave Bautista is trying to get to his daughter and Gita, but there's a mattress in the way. (laughs) Just absolutely true. And it's real dumb. And he finally gets through pops out in time to fire off a grenade launcher or something sure he's got that now it explodes and sends the zombie king flying and then he and the zombie is he dead now no 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 i don't know but we'll see what happens dave bautista kate and the mom they all head up to the roof and tig nataro is rightfully gone Mm -hmm. no sight or sound of a helicopter anywhere Bo. until she comes back for her again this is aliens it down to and including the pilot takes off comes back at the last minute when the zombie king arrives they get on the chopper start to leave and much like in aliens the villain then gets on the ship with our heroes yeah so dave bautista and our zombie king who leaps off the building to get in the helicopter they're beating each other up wrestling The zombie king breaks Dave Bautista's arm, creating a compound fracture. That's Mm -hmm. pretty gruesome. And then Dave Bautista drops his gun because he has a compound fracture. Kate clocks the zombie king in the head with a fire extinguisher. But then the zombie king bites Dave Bautista and you're like, ah, shit. And then off in the distance, we see that nuclear bomb flying through the air toward Las Vegas. Dave Bautista grabs his gun with his non-compound fracture arm and blows the zombie king's head off and then computer generated tig Notaro, she crash lands the helicopter as the nuclear bomb explodes in the background and there is no way anybody on this helicopter has survived like it is impossible credit where it's due because i will say one nice thing about this movie the moment after tig Notaro gets shot in the shoulder which is a thing that happens during this scuffle that don't matter oh yeah, yeah she yeah. immediately dies the moment where she wipes off the inside of the windshield of this helicopter to clear the blood off of it only to see this nuclear bomb going and it's a real like how are they gonna get out of this one spoilers they don't right they just end up crash landed tignataro apparently is dead again we don't really get a good resolution on that character because maybe it would be too expensive yeah Sure, join the crowd. We didn't get good resolution on most of these characters dying. We do see Tanaka watching all of this on television with the news with the nuclear bomb. He's drinking a highball and he kind of just like sits on his couch with a, well, shit. So he doesn't suffer any punishment. Yeah. And then we go back to the crash site. Kate somehow is outside the helicopter, still alive. She's about 100 feet from this burning helicopter. She should be dead, but she isn't. She looks around and she walks over and finds a dead computer generated Tig Notaro and then she heads over and she finds Dave Bautista outside the helicopter remember he got bit by the zombie king Mm -hmm. and then Dave Bautista perhaps not realizing the severity of the situation he says hey Kate how about how about food food truck that sells lobster rolls I could call it uh Claude's butter half sandwiches (laughs) like C-L-A-W-E-D because it's claws and butter what do you think about that (laughs) Oh my god, I think that's so great. I think I'm going to have to take care of those shitty kids, though. Oh, that that sounds pretty bad. Whoa, does this suddenly feel zombie in here all of a sudden? (laughs) Kate's like, like what he's like oh definitely feels feel like a lot feels kind of zombies coming on right now it's like ah oh, shit seriously ah oh, god damn it and then she grabs a gun and through this tearful exchange shoots dave bautista in the head killing him that's right the hero of our movie the star of our movie was just killed by his daughter and in the background a mushroom cloud rises up in the air and Bo, we hear the cranberries hit song Zahambe play uh, in the background. All right. 
To begin with, the song Zombie is not about zombies. No. The song Zombie is about the IRA and so forth, right. like the Civil War in right. Ireland. It's wildly out of place in this, sure. in this movie. But all... As would have been Tom Petty's Zombie Zoo. I would prefer them play your reference earlier to the Monster Mash, or maybe the theme to the Monsters. We leave this, the story of Kate and Dave Bautista behind as Zombie gets going... Because it's time we cut back to Van, who yes. is coming out of this vault after the bomb has hit. By the way, sure. all of them are dying from cancer in like a week and a half. How did he get out, Bo? Never mind. Yeah, just open the door. What's this handle do? Kukunk? Oh. <laughs> Oh, the thing I needed it to. And then he has these three giant bags of money. He walks through the, again, a radiated wasteland of Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Yes. To a trailer where he just uh -huh. steals a car that has both gas and keys just hanging out in it. Takes the car sure. to an airfield. And uh -huh. is like, hey, pretty lady behind the desk, I want to charter that private plane on the runway. And she's like, oh, I don't know if we can do that, yep. sir. And he starts stacking money up on the counter. And she says, oh, right okay. this way, sir. Right. Let me yeah. see what I can do. So cut to the final moments of this movie where Van is drinking champagne with the flight attendants and eating lobster tail. Having sure. somehow survived this zombie apocalypse and a bomb and everything, gotten away right. with all this money. And he starts staggering as he's giving this toast. Uh huh. And they're like, are you all right, sir? You're, you feel a little cool to the touch. Like perhaps you're a corpse or a zombie. Right. And he's like, no, 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 I'm going to be fine. Let me just go to the bathroom and splash some water. Take a face. shit. <laughs> right. right. And as he's in there, he finds a bite on his arm in the bathroom. And then you hear the pilot uh -huh. say, I uh, just want to tell everyone, especially the guy in the bathroom, who's probably a zombie. We're about to descend into <laughs> Mexico City. If you want to eat any of the crew members, we have about uh, 26 minutes until touchdown. It is a uh, balmy 83 degrees in Mexico City, and uh, the time is currently 1242. So let me be the first to welcome you to Mexico City. And then Van laughs and says, fuck. And that's the end of the movie. Fade to black, credits roll, as we hear Elvis Presley sing Suspicious Minds, the end. I mean, the only thing that's missing from this downer of a movie is like a text-based epilogue that says, oh, by the way, Kate got cancer and died a slow, painful death. It is unpleasant it's bad to look at the music drops are stupid the characters are thin all this zombie mythology is completely pointless and stupid the fact that you don't have good death scenes with these characters the closest you get is short timer with the gasoline backpack but everything else is pretty by the numbers like if you've ever seen a zombie movie before you've kind of seen all of that and the stuff that you haven't seen before like the zombie king and queen and the zombie baby that glows blue is so stupid yeah. that you can't get in invested in that there's a reason that the zombie movie works zombies aren't the real threat they are the wrinkle in what you're trying right to which do. is why this should have been a heist movie with the zombies as opposed to a zombie movie that kind of has a heist exactly because the heist is such an afterthought yes. in all of this it, it's incredibly wrong-headed it is the result of a filmmaker that again i am sure was going through a lot of pain due to what was happening with his family but please do not inflict that pain on us the viewing audience and it's terrible this is one of the worst zombie movie it's just one of the worst movies that we've ever done on this show it's long everything about it is bad and it looks cheap yeah that's another thing it it looks super chintzy for for having spent 90 million dollars on this movie it looks like garbage. i feel like a lot of these made for streaming service movies rely on digital technology and there's something about that that inherently looks cheaper than movies that mm -hmm. are made with practical effects on real sets for sure recently i was watching some of that coppola dracula which is one of the best looking movies conversely that i've ever seen mm -hmm. because it's all practical effects done in camera for the most part and it looks incredible yeah it's not good but you know Bo, for our next movie i decided to invite two actors who have appeared multiple times on this podcast to return and i'm referring to miss sandra bullock and mr john malkovich in a little movie mm -hmm. called bird box Bo, this film has everything you would want in a direct-to-streaming 
service movie. You've got A-list movie stars. They easily exceed your low expectations. There's shallow character development. There's an underdeveloped premise. There's an unsatisfactory ending. Machine Gun Kelly has sex with a woman in a laundry room. Dr. Wu from the Jurassic Park movie shows up. There's multiple suicides. There's rowboats. There's viral internet challenges. There's arguably litigious similarities to The Happening, a movie featured in episode to season 11 of this very podcast how could things go wrong i have seen bird box before and i can (laughs) assure you everything can and will go wrong it is hot garbage so (laughs) i'm looking forward to talking about it because it is truly one of the worst uh, of this style of quiet place hey what if we use these senses a- as a means of terror yeah you know, the silence is a good one too also a netflix original about like some kind of mutant bats or some nonsense also a quiet place inspired so yeah. you know there's several of these quiet place alikes out there and bird box is is one of the worst i think it's even based on a book it is Ugh. That yeah. seems stupid. Yeah. It's it's All gonna right, well, it's gonna be better than Army of the Dead, question mark. I would say that because it, Central Bullock at least has screen presence. As does Malkovich. Well, yeah. yeah. Of course. You can't do wrong with that. So no. at the very least, we're trading out I'll see your Dave Bautista and I'll up you a Bullock and a Malkovich. How about that? Yeah, I mean that's a winner. Sure. We're, that, that sounds right. way we, better. We've got to be at least doing something better. We'll see. Yeah, I don't know. For sure. Jesus Christ. All right, let's end this one. Uh, Bo, any final thoughts that you have on Army of the Dead? Uh, I would like to maybe put a little squeeze on Sandra Bullock for next week, yeah? And one maybe John Malkovich. Maybe Zimbos. One oh. in the left hand, one in the right. East meets west. Mm-hmm. That sounds like a real dangerous liaison. <laughs> We will see you all in two weeks' time. I gotta go take a shower. I feel gross. Yeah, this was terrible. (laughs) Thanks for listening, everybody. Mm